Hello, my name is Gil Zilka, and I am a classical music enthusiast. Uh, as a performer and a concert goer and also a, a recording collector. Uh, so welcome to my channel, uh, if you've not been here before. Uh, my enthusiasm for classical music goes back to when I was in diapers. My dad would play it. He was a collector of the old reel-to-reel -reel, uh, recordings. Uh, I remember he had this little can that had a, his card catalog in it that he would use to organize his reel-to-reels. Uh, so I grew to love uh, symphonies and concertos, and uh, I started learning the piano when I was a kid. Um, then, unexpectedly, uh, partly because I wanted to go on a choir trip to uh, Six Flags, I fell into singing uh, when I was in sixth grade, and then that became also a passion of mine. I was in choirs and started singing the great masterworks. Uh, and then I became a voice performance student. Uh, I got my master's from right here in Austin, Texas at the University of Texas. And uh, some of my performances are actually on my YouTube channel. But I am here to talk about classical music recordings. Uh, when I was in college, uh, I took a course in uh, music history from a, a great uh, musicologist named Elliot Antikolitz. And he was a real genius at breaking down the music and describing what it was that the composers were doing that elicited the different reactions that the audience has. So that was very fascinating. And I was also exposed to all the repertoire, which of course can be very intimidating when you're first getting into it. And uh, he gave us these listening tests and that really got me into the repertoire and started getting me into noticing the differences in performances and in, in the recordings. So that started this sort of obsession with, with hunting down the best recordings. And uh, that's what led me to, uh, to this video today. I'm calling this uh, Essential Classical Music. Uh, and in this particular video, I'll be talking about the best symphony recordings. Uh, and this will not only be the best recordings, but also in, in this video, I'm going to try to cover the, the major symphonies. So with all that said, uh, let's dig in. And appropriately enough, we're going to start with Ludwig van Beethoven. Uh, we're going to go in alphabetical order. Uh, Beethoven is, of course, uh, the most popular composer for symphonies. And he was the bridge between the classical and the romantic eras. And it was really this symphony, the Eroka, Symphony Number no. 3, where he found his voice. Uh, it, it became more of an individual, uh, more romantic, more dramatic. Uh, the, the length of the symphony was, you know, there was more length to it. And uh, for this one, my top choice is Otto Klemperer with the Philharmonia, recorded in 1959. This is his stereo recording. He did an earlier one in mono uh, in 1955 that some people prefer because it's a little quicker in the first movement. Uh, Klemperer famously tended to have slower tempos. But really, I think that this recording is the one that shows him at his best. It gives you the, the full Klemperer treatment, which was very patient. And instead of just hitting you on the head, out the gate, the power built slowly. And I think it's very effective, especially in the uh, funeral March, which is sort of the heart of the piece, the second movement. Uh, Klemper really plumps the depths in that movement. It's it's really a must must listen. Um, now, if you do want a little bit more energy uh, in that first movement, uh, I recommend Herbert von Karajan. Uh, similar uh, to Klemper in the you know the sort of traditional, you know, heaviness seriousness you might say, uh, drama and the. Um, and the sound is just wonderful in this recording. Uh, but definitely more uh, energy in that first movement. Uh, this is from Karajan's dig digital cycle. He did three complete cycles of the Berlin Philharmonic of Beethoven symphonies. Uh, and generally, the first two are the ones that people usually recommend uh, because they are more alert uh, and they have more energy. But I, I think this, this Eroica from the digital cycle was really his best one. Now, in addition, uh, a little different from Klemper and Karajan is George Zell and the Cleveland Orchestra. Zell was a conductor who, uh, he liked clean articulation. 
he tended to like faster tempos, but he was never idiosyncratic. And if you want clarity and crispness and energy, this is a great recording for that. Uh, the Funeral March is very eloquent. Uh, Zell's orchestra is always played beautifully and immaculately. And even though it's 1957, it's, it's a pretty good sounding recording. Uh, it's in stereo as well. Also, we have Nicholas Harnencourt with the Chamber Orchestra of Europe. This was recorded in 1990. This is a period performance. So uh, a lot of you probably know, uh, period performance is when you try to replicate instruments uh, from the time of the composer. Uh, so before, uh, around the 19th, uh, mid 19th century, when orchestras became bigger, uh, uh, the, the, this performance style tries to emphasize uh, clean articulation, uh, transparency, they usually have faster tempos. Uh, and it's somewhat controversial because sometimes that comes at the expense of uh, the full musicality, uh, you know, especially when everything's just going super fast all the time. Not in this recording. Harnacord is very musical and he also has a very pleasant sound. It doesn't sound too stringent. Uh, so this is a very good Eroica performance, especially if you want a period performance. Now, a couple of more. Uh, these are uh, studio recordings that come before the stereo era. Stereo era. Uh, the first one is 1951 Paul Van Kempen and the Berlin Philharmonic. Uh, this is a traditional performance. It's very powerful, very dramatic. Uh, the Berlin Philharmonic in fine form and, and Van Kempen really understood uh, the emotions of the work very well. Uh, so even though it's a little bit limited in sound, uh, it's, it still sounds pretty good. And that's, so that's a good recommendation, as well as Eric Kleiber with the Concertgebouw. This is from 1950. Uh, Kleiber has a little bit more energy. Uh, it, he, he uh, I mean, th this recording just, it grabs you by the throat from the very beginning and just never lets go. It's a real exciting performance, even though it's limited sound and, and in those days, the Decca recordings, uh, they could sound a little uh, wiry in the strings, uh, but still the interpretation is great, so well worth seeking out. Now, before leaving the Eroica, I want to touch on a few recordings that uh, are not only mono, but also were recorded live. And the first one I'm going to discuss is Wilhelm Furtwängler. Uh, Fort Wenger was known for his Beethoven. Uh, he was the conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic for several decades. And the thing about Fort Wenger is he was of the, in, I guess you can call it the subjective school. I like to call it the intuitive school. He, he was, he could, his performances tended to vary because he, he conducted in the moment. So the difficult thing is, is his performances could really be different from one to the next. And the other thing about him is uh, it was really live performances that brought out the best in him. His, his studio recordings could be comparatively a little bit more stale, still very good. So for example, the Eroka he recorded in studio for EMI with uh, the Vienna Philharmonic. And that's a very good recording because you see his conception of the, of the piece and that's definitely recommendable if we didn't have anything else. However, we have his live recordings, and that's really where, what brought out the best in him. So the first one I want to recommend is this was recorded during World War II in 1944 with the Vienna Philharmonic. And it's very intense, uh, very concentrated. The funeral march is just uh, amazing. Uh, and it, the recording quality is really not too bad for 1944. It's definitely limited, uh, but it's, it's fairly clear. However, uh, even more recommendable than that, I would say, is his Berlin Philharmonic recording from after the war. Uh, this is from December 8th, 1952. You have to be careful because there's also one from the day before. Uh, December 8th. And this one actually sounds really good, even though it's a live recording. Uh, it, it, it's one of the best uh, recordings uh, Furt Wenger ever got in his live recordings. And this one is just uh, masterful in the way he, he builds the tension and that funeral, funeral march. Uh, it's just, to me, I, I don't think I've ever heard one that's that uh, emotionally overwhelming. So that's Furt Wenger. 
sort of the antithesis of Fort Wengler uh, among first half of the century conductors was, of course, Arturo Toscanini. Toscanini was not of the, you know, if you're going to generalize, he was not the subjective, intuitive type. He was more the objective type who, who believed that the score tells you exactly what to do and you just follow that. And he was a little bit more consistent from recording to recording. However, even that said, I still think uh, in, in, even in his case, his life performances would, would bring more out of him. And I think that's the case here with his 1939 Eroica. Uh, now, a another difference with Toscanini is uh, where, whereas Furtwanger was more like Klemperer in that things built slowly, uh, with Toscanini, uh, he was more uh, like Kleiber, or you might even say more like the period instruments of today where a, a lot of energy moving quickly. And this first movement is just ferocious. It's it's just fantastic. Uh, and then the funeral march uh, is very eloquent. Uh, it, 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 it just really sings. So I, I would say that even though they're, they're such different interpretations, the Furtwängler and the Toscanini are for me uh, my favorite Eroicas in terms of interpretation. So that just goes to show that uh, all differences aside, uh, you, there are many ways, many ways to do it. So that is the Eroica. Uh, I'm going to skip over the fourth and I'm going to talk about uh, another one of the most famous symphonies ever written, the Beethoven Fifth, of course, with the dun 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 at the beginning. And then this, this just wonderful transition between the final two movements where it, it goes from this hushed quietness and just builds and builds into an explosion, you know, a triumphant explosion. And the best recordings are the ones that really make the most out of that as, as well. Uh, my top choice for this one is uh, not controversial at all. I, I, I'm sorry to say <laughs> I'm not going to try to make waves with this. Uh, my top choice is Carlos Kleiber and the Vienna Philharmonic, uh, arguably the most famous classical music recording ever made. Uh, it was recorded in 1974. And the reason it caused such a sensation is it's just so darned electric uh, right from the beginning. Uh, Carlos Kleiber was just such an exciting. He was the, the son of Eric Kleiber, incidentally, who we just talked about. And uh, he, it wasn't like he just played everything, you know, conducted everything fast. Uh, he, he had this uh, great sense of drama, uh, I think is what really set Kleiber apart. Uh, so, uh, and the Vienna Philharmonic sounds great. The sound quality is great. Uh, it's legendary for a reason. That said, uh, there are other ways to do it. And uh, another recommendation that I have from the same time period, uh, this is from 1976, is Leonard Bernstein. Now, Bernstein was more of the, the patient school, you might say. Uh, you know, you, you, don't, you don't typically turn on his Beethoven and, and get wowed right away. Uh, but he understood, he, he knew how to pick his spots and he understood the structure of the work so that this Fifth Symphony is, is powerful in a way that grows on you as, as you're listening. Uh, now, I want to emphasize that uh, this recording is a live recording from uh, an Amnesty International concert uh, he did with the Bavarian Symphony, uh, Bavarian Radio Symphony Orchestra. Uh, this is not the Vienna Philharmonic recording from his uh, complete cycle that he did a few years later. That one actually is a little bit, for me, uh, it's not just that it's slow, but it, it, it kind of lacks enough energy uh, to, uh, for me for the fifth symphony but this one this one is a really great performance it's a little bit more eccentric a little bit slower uh but it's it's really great uh now another recording that is uh, this time on the more aggressive side uh, the more energy energetic side is sir charles mccarris with the royal philharmonic uh, symphony orchestra in 1992 this was recorded this was also from a full cycle and Macaris 
is he's not a period performer, but he's about as close as you can get to a period performance with modern instruments. He uh, tends to favor uh, a lighter sound, uh, uh, more transparency, and definitely faster tempos. Uh, particularly the adagios and the andantes, the slow movements uh, with Macaris, uh, they tend to be on the quicker end. Uh, now, if there's one symphony that benefits from this approach, I would say it's this one, the Fifth Symphony, from, that benefits from that sort of driving forward uh, characteristic of Macaris. Uh, but it's very musical, and uh, even though it's a little bit lighter in sound than, say, Kleiber or Bernstein, it's, uh, it's very dramatic and very powerful, and he just really, uh, he just really knew how to uh, how to do this symphony and uh, this is one of my top choices as well as uh, and and this one's very different this is a period performance from 2007 this is Yas van Immerzeel with the I'm going to see if I can say this right Anima Eterna Brugge Orchestra this is definitely a period performance and it is very light and very quick uh, but uh, Immerzil really shows the benefits of period performance in the dexterity and and the ability to art articulate and, and play things quickly and and he does in a way that really truly is exciting in its own way even if it doesn't have the big powerful chords that we're used to from people like Klemper and, and Carrion and, and Fort Wengler for example uh, definitely one to definitely one to check out now, again, I want to go back and look at a couple of studio recordings that are in uh, not as good sound, that are in mono, but uh, still worth looking at. Uh, one is from Klemperer again. This time it is his mono recording from 1955. Uh, he did do one in stereo, but this is really the one that is the more, the more exciting one. And again, with Klemperer, uh, it's it, it's almost like you, you hear these other recordings and then Klemper comes and he's like let me show you kids how to do it because he's he's very uh, steady very disciplined but he has this this relentlessness about the way he goes about it that's just you just you just keep listening uh, it's very powerful in its own way uh, now on the other hand we have again where did I put it we have the Kleiber, Eric Kleiber, father of Carlos. This is coupled with the Third Symphony. So this is also the Concertgebouw. This one was recorded in 1953. And it's, it's not a carbon copy of his son. It, it definitely has the energy and the excitement, and it's, it's a bit faster. Uh, but uh, I would say with, with Eric Kleiber, there's even more of a feeling of looseness about it. It's, it's even less controlled and almost more of a wild abandon to it, a more, a more of a grittiness to it. And again, even though the recording quality is not perfect, it's, it's still pretty good. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more rough, uh, but it's, it's really an exciting Beethoven fifth. However, Again, I have to go back to uh, the, those two giants of the first half of the, of the 20th century. Uh, first of all, uh, Fort Wengler. Uh, Fort Wengler, of course, was known for his Fifth Symphony. Uh, he did one, now, I want to say again, he did one in the studio for EMI uh, with the Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, I said that the Eroka he did was still really good. Um, the Fifth Symphony, a lot of people admire it, and it, it definitely it has his conception is there, uh, but it, it, especially this recording of the Fifth Symphony, I think, doesn't have the same energy that you see in his live performances. Uh, so that's one where I I, I think it, it's uh, a mistake if you listen to that and think you're getting the full Fort Wengler. Uh, really, you need to hear his live performances. Uh, the first one uh, that people often turn to is the wartime. Uh, recording of the fifth. Uh, this was recorded with the Berlin Philharmonic in 1944, uh, and it it shows you his conception in a in fairly good sound for its period. Uh, it's not very noisy, although it is limited, uh, and it's it's very powerful. However, it's in my opinion really his, a couple of performances that he did after the war that uh, show for Wenger in best form. Uh, the first one I want to recommend, it, this is actually his first recording or first performance he made after World War II. Uh, this is with the Berlin Philharmonic 
from May 25th, 1947. <laughs> Again, you had to be careful. He did one a couple of days later, which is also pretty good. Uh, but really, this is the one that to me is may maybe for me the most thrilling uh, Beethoven fifth uh, that I've ever heard. Uh, you can tell that the excitement of, of returning to Berlin uh, to his to his people again after the devastation of World War II was something that was really emotional. In fact, uh, there was a story that the Allies after the concert were worried that that this was some sort of a, a political demonstration because the crowd was going so wild. Uh, it's just uh, right out the gate. It's just electric, and uh, in particular, uh, one one thing I want to point out is the the very end, the coda of the symphony, which sometimes you know it's like bum. Bum, 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 you know, it's, it, it just keeps repeating those chords and, and it gets a little bit tedious in some recordings. Not with this one. Uh, this one, all the way to the end, it's it just holds your attention. And it's just fantastic. Uh, so that's a great one. Uh, another one is the, where is it? This is the May 23rd, 1954 recording. Uh, this one's a little bit slower uh, than that 1947 recording. Uh, it, it's it's not as freewheeling perhaps, but it's really powerful. Just these strong granitic chords. Uh, the transition from the third movement into the finale. I've I've never heard one like it before. That just it's it's just the way it comes out and just oh you know it's it's just so powerful. So there's that. Uh, we also of course then have Toscanini. This is again from his uh, 1939. Uh, cycle of radio uh, broadcasts he did of the Berlin, uh, sorry, of the Beethoven symphonies with his uh, NBC Symphony Orchestra. And this one is just, again, electric, that first movement. You're, you're not going to hear one like this. Uh, it's almost militar militaristic the way it's just, I don't know, you know, just, just so, uh, uh, how to put it, uh, it, it it's kind of clipped very sharp and clipped and and uh, and very very disciplined and yet exciting and free at the same time uh, and ag again that transition from the third movement to the final movement is just real exciting so another example of where there are different ways to do it and and you you just you really can't replace these performances uh, they're, they're kind of one of a kind even though they have limited sound so that's the fifth symphony uh, next, we're going to discuss Symphony Number no. Six, the Pastoral Symphony, and this was Beethoven's programmatic symphony, uh, meaning that it wasn't just abstract music, but he was actually depicting something, and in this case, he was depicting nature. Uh, and in particular, the word pastoral it connotes uh, this feeling of, of of bliss, of tranquility. And my top choice for this symphony is one that I think succeeds in that, and that is, again, Klemperer, this time in stereo from 1957. Uh, and this version is famously slow. Uh, a lot of people think it's too slow, but the reason I pick this version is I think it really does succeed in that atmosphere uh, of tranquility. Uh, it, again, Klemperer's way of, of just being very steady uh, and in the way that uh, it, it's almost hypnotic the way he does that it, it really works well so that is my top choice however there are other ways to do it as well a uh, very famous recording is from Carl Bame this is or Carl Boom you might say with it's got the B O with the umlaut H M Carl Boom excuse me uh, this is with the Vienna Philharmonic and this was recorded in 1971 it's part of his complete cycle with the Vienna Philharmonic, which incidentally, I'm not a big fan of cycles because uh, they tend to be, you know, variable. Uh, it's really hard to uh, have, you know, a, a, a consistent level of artistry throughout an entire cycle. But I think Bim comes as close as anybody uh, to, to doing that. Uh, it really, the, only the Fifth Symphony, I would say, is maybe, Bame could be a little bit uh, uh, trudge-like uh, sometimes, and the Fifth Symphony, Fifth Symphony suffers from that, uh, but the rest is fantastic. Uh, he is immaculate in his understanding of Beethoven, 
and uh, the beauty of the Vienna Philharmonic and the sound quality, the, the, the detail, uh, it really is, to me, I think maybe the most uh, recommendable uh, cycle, complete cycle, and actually I even have that cycle. One of the few, actually the only complete cycle that I own is, is this one. Uh, now, compared to the Klemper in the past, Pastoral Symphony, uh, it's very beautiful, very natural sounding, as Bame tended to be, and has a little bit more spirit in that first movement compared to, to Klemper. So definitely that is an option as well. Now, for someone who also was very well known for the Pastoral Symphony, who we haven't dis discussed yet, is Bruno Walter. Uh, this is with the Columbia Symphony. Uh, this was recorded in 1958. Uh, sounds pretty good. It's in stereo. And Walter was known for... Uh, he, he was an exciting conductor, particularly in his younger years. But what he really was known for, and, and, and fair or unfair, we know him more from his recordings from his last years that he made, you know, these stereo recordings, particularly with, with the Columbia Symphony where he's more known for his, his warmth and his gentleness. And that really comes out here. That's why this is such a popular uh, version of the Pastoral Symphony. The only problem with it, I would say, is, is the storm. Uh, it's, it's more like a, a small sprinkle. It's, it's not exactly uh, very menacing. Uh, but, you know, it, it still fits with the conception as a whole. Uh, and it's, it's, it's definitely a version that uh, if you love the symphony, you're going to want to hear. Uh, this particular issue is, is, is coupled with a really good fourth symphony, incidentally. Uh, now, another stereo version, and this is also from a complete cycle, uh, comes from André Cluton, uh, French conductor, but with the Berlin Philharmonic. This was recorded in 1960. And this is another one that I would say the, the complete cycle is uh, pretty good. It's one of the most consistent around. Uh, it's one that I would recommend among the top choices if you want consistency, uh, which, which you get from Cliton. He was not as flashy maybe as someone like, say, Carrion, not as individual as someone like Klemperer. But, uh, but you could always count on him for uh, a, a really good interpretation. Uh, and, and, and this is no exception. This is probably the highlight of, of that cycle is this pastoral symphony. Uh, sounding pretty good in 1958 stereo. Uh, and then I, I'm going to recommend as well one historic version. And that is the, uh, the Furtwängler again. And uh, the ones that I already recommended, the two concerts that uh, featured the fifth symphony also featured the sixth symphony. Uh, in this case, you know, this one I said is the more dramatic of the fifths, and, and this one is the better recorded, a little bit slower. I think that that slower approach actually works better in the pastoral symphony. Uh, this may be my, my favorite version of all among pastoral symphonies. Uh, it's just gorgeous. The way he goes from the storm, which, which is really dramatic in his hands, to the, uh, the feeling of tranquility you get in that final movement. Uh, it, it really is wonderful. Uh, th th this one is really good too. It's, it's not as well recorded, not as full as this. It, that's the same is true for both the fifth and the sixth symphony, both these recordings. Um, but it also is, is really, uh, really good. Um, the only thing I would say about Furtwängler, and, and, and this is a, a common criticism, is that uh, because he, he was so probing and, uh, and so dramatic, it may have been a little bit much for this symphony. Uh, like I said, it, with, with Klemper, for example, and with Baim and, and Walter, you get this feeling of naturalness, of tranquility. Sometimes the drama that Furtwängler brought to it may have been a bit much, but it's still, it's, it's so musical that it's one that I still, I, I still have to recommend. Uh, incidentally, uh, both for the fifth and the sixth symphonies, uh, these are the Tara issues. Uh, Tara, T-A-H-R-A. -A. Uh, those are generally the best versions of these live Furtwängler concerts, um, but they are difficult to find. Uh, if you're willing to invest in a box set, uh, probably the best box set of Furtwängler performances is this one from Audite. Uh, this one actually has both of these two concerts from 1947 and 1954. Uh, one is at the very beginning of this set and one is at the very end. Uh, so these are, I believe, all his, his broadcasts, uh, all his um, 
live performances that with the Berlin Philharmonic after the war. So, and it's really, I would say, uh, in terms of a, a set, this, this shows Furt Wenger at, at his best. So that is the Pastoral Symphony. Now let's talk about Symphony Number no. 7. Uh, has that, uh, to me, what always you know, stood out to me first was that uh, Allegretto, bum 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 that second movement it's it's one of the ones that uh, even people who don't know classical music very well uh, will be an, able to identify that but the rest of the symphony is is more uh, dance like uh, it's very rhythmic uh, very exciting and uh, my top choice for this symphony is Leonard Bernstein Vienna Philharmonic 1979 this comes from his complete cycle. I alluded to that earlier when I talked about the fifth symphony in that cycle being a little weak. The rest of the cycle is excellent. It's, it's actually ironically similar to Carl Bim uh, with the Vienna Philharmonic. And they're both with the Vienna Philharmonic, incidentally, on Deutsche Grammophon. Uh, both of them uh, have a sort of a, a weaker fifth, but the rest of the cycle is excellent. So Bernstein is another one where I would recommend if you're looking for complete cycles and you want sort of a modern traditional interpretation, uh, Bernstein is an excellent choice. Uh, in, in this recording, um, his gifts for, uh, for uh, rhythm really are on display in this. Uh, it, he combines that with also uh, power and um, the beauty of the Vienna, Vienna Philharmonic. And for my money, this is, this is really uh, an, an excellent all-around choice. Uh, also, we were just talking about Carl Bame. Uh, his Seventh Symphony is also one of my top choices. Uh, it, it is, he's, he's a little bit more steady in his tempos, um, but it's a really beautiful recording and very natural. That's, that's the thing about Bame is, is everything he did just sounded very natural, not very you know, like someone imposing his will. And, and, and this is just a, a gorgeous recording, particularly if you like that second movement, uh, Allegretto. Now, he could be a little bit stately in his tempos, and so that, that final movement may, may, not be, may not have the wild abandon and energy that a lot of people like. Uh, you, will, you cannot say that about, uh, that about Carlos Kleiber. Uh, uh, this may be the most famous interpretation of the Seventh Symphony. This is uh, the one from 1976 with the Vienna Philharmonic that's coupled with his famous Fifth Symphony. And it shares many of the same qualities. Uh, it's very incisive, very dramatic. Uh, the Allegretto moves a little bit more, if, if that's your cup of tea. Um, and then the finale, uh, he was always really great in the finale, but even more so, I would say, in this live recording from 1982 with the Bavarian State Orchestra, or the, uh, as you say in German, Bayerischen uh, Staatsorchestra, uh, um, which is actually the way you'll you'll see it on the on the title there. Um, th this one is just really uh, electric uh, and on and on fire, uh, especially in that last movement. So that is Kleiber, uh, another version, stereo version, that if you like it quicker, especially in the Allegretto, is uh, Macaris again. And again, this is also coupled with the Fifth Symphony. Uh, and again, this comes from a complete cycle as well. I don't know if I had, had mentioned that earlier, but he did a complete cycle with the Royal from uh, the, uh, uh, sorry, the <laughs> our Royal Liverpool Philharmonic. Um, and again, Macaris, it tended to favor quicker tempos, uh, and it almost sounds like a period performance, even though it's a modern orchestra, uh, that Allegretto moves a little bit more. Um, and the, the, uh, the rest of the symphony, uh, it definitely, definitely benefits from McCarris's approach. Uh, now, a few historic recordings I wanna talk about. One is going back again, this again is a coupling with the fifth. This is Klemperer from 1955 in mono with his fifth symphony. And I will just repeat uh, the same things I've been saying about the, the previous uh, Klemperer uh, performances, that it's, it's uh, more uh, disciplined uh, in terms of it's, it's not rushing forward at all, but there's this almost hyp hypnotic, relentless quality to the way he moves forward that I, I just, uh, it, it, it keeps my attention throughout, even though 
it is not as you know uh, how to put it not as um, uh, uh, aggressive in the way the way he approaches it but it, it really does work uh, and the Frail Harmonia sounds beautiful even though it's a mono recording uh, also I want to recommend Fortfinger as well for this one and this is actually one of his better sounding recordings this is from 1953 it's a live recording it's coupled with an excellent eighth uh, and it's somewhat similar to the Klemper approach, except there's more flexibility uh, in the way uh, Furtwängler did it, and uh, it really works wonderfully. Uh, the third movement has the, the tempo fluctuations, almost you know they kind of keep you on the edge of your seat. And the way he ends the finale with a, a slight quickening of the tempo to the very end, uh, that that really works well. Um, and uh, again, it's it, it's a very good sounding recording for live recording uh, from 1953. I do want to mention, so this is Deutsche Grammophon. Um, there is another box set that I would say next to that Audi set is probably the best one for uh, Fort Wenger, and that is this. This is uh, Deutsche Grammophon and a few Decca recordings sprinkled in of Fort Wenger. This is both studio and live performances, and this is just a gold mine. Uh, I'm going to keep referring to this one later. Uh, a goldmine in terms of uh, Furt Wenger, his, his best stuff. So this one includes both that seventh and eighth that I just alluded to. All right, and then we have one more to talk about. I'm not going to leave this one out. Toscanini. This is his 1936 New York Philharmonic recording, a legendary performance. Um, it's, it's definitely a little bit more limited in sound. A little bit more crackly, a little, uh, you know, less fullness to it, uh, and it's not maybe quite what you would expect uh, based on his other performances. It's it's actually not, it's it's uh, it's actually a little bit more conventional in terms of its tempo. It's not that aggressive, uh, but it's it still has that that Toscanini discipline to it, that incisiveness, uh, uh, that excitement. Um, and uh, the finale, uh, especially in, in his hands, you know, you got to hear Toscanini do it. So that is the seventh. And now we come to probably the most famous symphony of all, uh, Beethoven's crowning achievement, the ninth, the choral symphony, which famously has the choral uh, uh, contribution at the end with the, the, the famous O to Joy theme. Uh, for this symphony, my top choice uh, is not very controversial. A lot of people recommend this one also. Ferenc Fritschoy with the Berlin Philharmonic from 19, I think it's 1958, uh, 57 or 58. Um, pretty good sounding stereo. It, it may be just a tiny bit of hiss, but but very good stereo, very full sound. And and this one, I, it just really, it, it just checks all the boxes uh, in terms of drama, excitement, spirituality, uh, great playing, uh, great singing, choral contribution, and and Fritschoy just does a masterful job with this symphony. So for an all-around, it, it's it's not always easy to find a great ninth because there's many more variables with the ninth because it's so long. Uh, it, it, there's so many different emotions and then you have also the choir and the soloist added in and the conductor really has to know what he's doing. So this is one that I really think that if you're looking for something that that is a ninth to live with, uh, Free Choi is my choice. But uh, there are several other great ones, and uh, especially with the ninth, I don't think that's one that you're going to want to have just one version. Uh, definitely one of the most famous versions is also Carrion. Uh, this is his 1976 recording uh, with the Berlin Philharmonic from that 1970s uh, complete cycle. This is actually a a, a super audio uh, version. Uh, I, you're more likely to find it uh, in its version, the, the the normal version that has like the white cover, uh, which I think uh, is the same for all the symphonies that he recorded with the uh, uh, with in that 70s cycle. Um, this one, uh, first of all, he his the one from the the 1960s set. Uh, that's the big debate: is is that one versus this one? Uh, a lot of people prefer that one. I think that this is the one that Carrion is a little bit uh, uh, more loose 
and more dramatic. And, uh, you know, you get the full carry on treatment. You get the, the big sound, the, the lush, the lush sound from the Berlin Philharmonic. Uh, carry on was just a master showman. He was very dramatic. And, uh, you know, you, you have to hear carry on in the Beethoven ninth. Uh, the one thing I would say, uh, for, first of all, the soloists are fantastic. But the one thing I would say is, for whatever reason, in carry on's Beethoven ninth, um, the choir tended to be a little bit more kind of small sounding, kind of recessed. And I don't know if that was from the way it was recorded or not, but it's it it's not the big wall of sound that you get with some versions. Uh, that is the one the one little thing I would say. I, I would say if, if that was not the case, I might say this is more of an unqualified top choice. Uh, now, another recording from around the same time is Bernstein with the Vienna Philharmonic, uh, recorded in 1979. This is, again, from his uh, Vienna Philharmonic cycle. And this is a great one, especially for uh, Bernstein's sense of, sense of spirituality. It really comes through with this one. Again, he, he kind of starts it a little bit slowly. The drama doesn't just hit you over the head. Uh, so it, it sort of builds slowly. He sort of makes the, the symphonic argument, if you will, uh, you know, over over time, and uh, it's it's really an experience. The adagio, uh, he he really milks the emotions in the adagio. The singing is fantastic on this version, uh, especially from the choir. Very uh, just you know just singing their lungs out, and it's it's one of the best finales uh, of any ninth that I know. So this is a this is a strong choice as well. Uh, now mentioned. Bernstein's cycle being one of the strongest, and again, Bame is the one that I think is is maybe the strongest, and he crowns it with with a great ninth, uh, just really powerful, strong, beautiful playing, beautiful singing, uh, great recording quality. Uh, the one caveat for that one is he takes a a much slower tempo for the march that happens in the fourth movement that starts with the the tenor. You know that one. Um, and it starts with the da 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 da. Except I'm doing it a lot faster than Bain does it. He does it at kind of this slow, slower marching tempo, which, you know, you can get used to. But it 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 it, it definitely it, it 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 takes a little bit of that that momentum away, and that that goes all the way through the O to Joy chorus then, which also sounds slower. That said. It's still a really powerful performance and, and one of the great ninths. Now, for something that is really not idiosyncratic and and sounds, you know, kind of there's really nothing bad to say about it. Certainly, in terms of of the tempo choices uh, or the performance quality itself, is Georg Schulte with the Chicago Symphony. Uh, of course, Schulte was in Chicago for many decades and. Uh, he was known, he was a recording giant. He recorded just about everything. And um, the thing about the Schulte uh, performance of the Beethoven Ninth is it's, it's a, a very sharp, uh, very incisive, dramatic, but not idiosyncratic at all. It, it, he, he just gives you the Beethoven Ninth, um, uh, and, and, and there's, Without any, uh, how to put it, you know, it's, it's never ponderous. It, the adagio is on what some people might say the slow side, um, but I mean, it is an adagio and he sustains it. it he makes it work. And then the singing is fantastic. Uh, the chorus, uh, trained by Margaret Hillis, who I had the privilege of singing once in my youth, uh, sing with, with, singing with. Um, the chorus is very disciplined, very strong. I, I talked about how Carrion, it, it sounded a little bit like a letdown because of the, of the sound of the chorus, not, not in this version. Uh, the chorus really hits you with that wall of sound that you want. So uh, this is a good central recommendation for the ninth, as is one from a little bit earlier from 1965, Hans Schmidt Isserstedt with the Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, this is sort of an under the radar version. He wasn't the flashiest, flashiest of conductors. And to be fair, it's not the most dramatic ninth, but it's a very solid ninth. Uh, it's a very, uh, it's a very spiritual ninth and it's got fantastic singing. Maybe, maybe the best quartet of singers. Uh, 
you got uh, Joan Sutherland and Marilyn Horn, uh, the, the, the Rossini uh, dynamic duo uh, in the soprano and alto uh, soloist. You have James King at the tenor. And then lesser known Marty Talvela, the bass. He sounds fantastic, as does the uh, Vienna Staatsopernchor. Uh, the recording is very sumptuous, very beautiful. So that's, that's also a very strong ninth. Now, we've talked about uh, stereo recordings that are in sort of the traditional mold. I want to mention a couple that are more either period or period-like. And the first one is, again, Charles McCarris with the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic. This was recorded in 1991, uh, and it's gonna have, it, it has faster tempos. Even the adagio is taken at a very fast tempo. Uh, but it's it's very exciting, very energetic, and it's it's definitely another way to hear the symphony. Uh, my my one major complaint, first of all, you have Bryn Terfel on this recording, who sounds fantastic as the bass soloist. But then the choir is a little bit. They have that. Uh, I don't know how to. It, it, it's like this white sound. I don't know how else to describe it. It's like, ah, it, it's it's not the full strong sound that you you typically want with a Beethoven ninth um, but it's it 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 still works in terms of the performance uh, the, the performance I'm trying to say is is it's it, Macaris's conception of it the the drama and the the forward momentum it still makes that worth listening to however you get the same thing with Gardner John Elliot Gardner and the uh, orchestra revolutionaire uh, what wait Orchestra Revolutionaire et Romantique uh, with his Monteverdi Choir. Now, the choir on this one is excellent. Uh, this is from Gardner's period instrument cycle from the early 90s that really caused a sensation. And if period performance is your cup of tea, that one along with the Harlancourt and the Immerzeel uh, is one to look for. Uh, it's wonderfully recorded. Uh, very, very strong, great tone. Uh, Gardner really uses a lot of fast tempos that challenge his, his instruments uh, to their limits. Uh, but it, you know, I, I almost want to say as a novelty because it's, it's, it's not necessarily a performance I'm going to live with, but it, it, it is very impressive is what, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and so for that reason, I recommend it. And it definitely makes an impact. And that final movement, especially with the with the excellent Monteverdi choir, that really packs a wallop. So uh, we have a few more recordings to talk about with the Beethoven Ninth, and uh, sort of the last, but but not by any means least. Uh, first is Klemperer. Uh, this is with the Philharmonia. This is recorded in 1961. There also is a 1957 recording, and, and these are both live versions, not his uh, stereo studio recording, which is, is, is very good, but it is a little bit on the, it's, it's, it's a little lacking in energy. Uh, these live performances really brought out the best in him. And you get, you know, the, the clumper treatment with this. You get this, this, just this massive power and strength and relentlessness uh, the soloists are all great. Uh, the, the recording is, is uh, you know, it's, it's a, uh, a live recording. So even though it's, it's in stereo, it's, it's a little bit noisy and a little bit more limited. But there's a sense of occasion that really makes this uh, something that you must hear if you love the Ninth Symphony. However, if you're going to talk about the Ninth Symphony, uh, it's almost inescapable that you talk about uh, Fortfanger. Uh, this is probably the work with which he was most identified in his career. Uh, he never recorded it in studio. Uh, it's, it's his live performances that really show his best. And there are three that are typically debated uh, in terms of which one's showman is best. And really, I think all three are so different from each other that I, I recommend really all three. Uh, the one I start with, though, is the one that is the most familiar to people. And this is the famous 1951 recording with the Bayreuth Festival. The Bayreuth Festival is, is Wagner's festival uh, that uh, closed down during the war, <coughs> but then reopened in 1951. And this was a sort of a commemoration of the reopening of Bayreuth. And, uh, of course, there's a sense of occasion 
but it's also a really uh, fantastic performance. It's the the sound quality is is somewhat limited, but it, it this transfer Orfeo not not the EMI transfer that um, probably more people are familiar with, but the Orfeo transfer uh, is is pretty good. It's got good presence. Um, it's a little bit noisy in some parts. Uh, the orchestral playing is a little bit untidy. Um, the chorus sounds a little bit, you know, recessed, but that's why not why we're listening to this. We're listening to this for uh, Furtwängler's uh, wonderful interpretation, uh, the 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 drama, the emotion, the spirituality, uh, the heartfelt ad adagio. He, it's it's really long, but he sustains it. You know, the thing about tempo. It's it's not a question of how long something takes. You can you can conduct something in half the time, and it sounds like you're just trying to get through it so that the you know the audience is bored. Whereas you can conduct something in, in, in uh, you know like in this case uh, what twenty minutes, uh, nineteen and a half minutes for the adagio, but the way Furtwängler sustains it is in a way that just keeps you captivated the whole time, and then uh, the final movement it just the emotions all just really spill out. So this is the first one that I recommend to people. However, uh, he did one in 1954 with the Lucerne Festival. Uh, and this is an Audite, Audite transfer, uh, the same company as that put out this box. It's not in this box, but it is the same company. Uh, this is a really fantastic transfer. Uh, there also is a, a Tara transfer as well. Uh, this version, first of all, is his best recorded ninth by far. So if recording quality is something that you care about uh, and you want to hear Furtwängler the Beethoven Ninth, uh, this is probably your best bet. Uh, it does have uh, all the hallmarks of a Furtwängler performance. It's very spiritual, especially the adagio and the final movement. Uh, I will say that compared to the Bayreuth uh, performance, it's, it's uh, maybe just a little bit more lacking in intensity. Um, so that's why I tend to prefer, uh, prefer that one, but definitely with the sound quality and you still have all the, the special qualities of a Furtwängler performance, uh, this one is still worth seeking out. Um, however, um, my Desert Island, not just Furtwängler Ninth, but, but Beethoven Ninth in general, is the one from the wartime, uh, the wartime performance from 1942. That's in this box, the same one that has the, uh, the Vienna 1944 Eroka and the 1943 Fifth. Um, this was recorded actually, uh, I think it was March 22nd, 1942. The reason that's important is that there was a performance which was given on, uh, or either like on or the day before Hitler's birthday, April 19th, I think it was. Uh, that one, it, someone released it somewhere. Uh, it's it's not as inspired a recording, but this one, this one from March of 1942 is the famous one. And all I can say about it is it's the most dramatic and intense performance of the ninth I've ever heard. Uh, it, right from the beginning to the end. Uh, and, you know, even though the sound quality is, is, it's more limited, it's muddy, it's not really bad for 1942 though. You can still pretty much hear most everything. Uh, but they were just in this zone, almost like they were just possessed. They're, they're just so deep into the music. Uh, the one criticism uh, that uh, people uh, often uh, have against this one compared to Fur Vengo's other performances is that it's maybe even too intense, maybe you know, too over the top. And uh, I, can, I can understand that argument. And so you might say that the 1951 is the more balanced uh, compared to that. But if if you want to hear uh, Beethoven Ninth, unlike any that you're probably ever going to hear, uh, this 1942 Ninth is is definitely one to hear. Okay, so that gets us through Beethoven. <laughs> oh my goodness, I I don't know if I'm going to get through all this, but I'm going to try. Um, the next composer we're going to talk about is Hector Berlioz, a uh, French composer of the Romantic era, and he wrote. Uh, his, his big masterpiece is the Symphonie Fantastique, which actually was written just a few years after the Beethoven Ninth. And it's, this is the full romantic treatment, a big orchestra, uh, programmatic, uh, and uh, just, just a lot of fun. Um, the first 
uh, my first recommendation for this one is uh, excellent sounding recording from Paul Pere and the Detroit Symphony. Uh, this was recorded in 1959, uh, but this series of recordings, Mercury Leaving Presence, uh, these are some of the best recordings around, uh, e despite the fact that they were recorded over 60 years ago. Very present, very detailed, very vibrant, and the same is true of the performance. Uh, Pere just brings this uh, this sort of French charm to to it. The, there, there is a, a beauty to it. Uh, the, the Symphony Fantastique, uh, it's very dramatic and exciting in the final two movements, but there's more to it than just that. Uh, you, you want a performance that also has character and charm, and you definitely get that with this. Uh, another recording from the same year, actually, uh, is Sir Thomas Beecham, who also was a Berlioz specialist. Uh, this is with the Orchestre National uh, de la Rede Diffusion Française. Uh, and the recording quality is very good. I wouldn't say as good as the Mercury, but, but very good. And Beecham, Beecham just had this dramatic panache uh, with everything he conducted. And so this is, this is just real exciting and, and powerful uh, and characterful uh, all the way through. Uh, another uh, recording that is very well known among Symphony Fantastiques, of course, is Sir Colin Davis. Uh, this is his recording with the Concertgebouw from 1974. And this one, I will say, it's not as exciting uh, as, as some others, um, but it's very beautiful, really gorgeous. Uh, the Concertgebouw, you know, one of the great orchestras, and uh, Davis had this wonderful touch. And so especially if you want to hear a complete recording, not just drama at the very end, but from beginning to end, uh, you want to hear the beauty and the detail in the, in the orchestral sound, um, this is uh, still a, a strong contender. Uh, however, I also want to mention one more recording, and this one is from way back. This is from 1931, Pierre Monteux and the Paris Symphony Orchestra. Uh, this is on uh, Pearl. I'm not sure if that's the only place to find it. It's actually really hard to find. Um, uh, and in this one, you know, it's very limited. Uh, you can't hear details very well, of course, at all uh, from such an old recording. But boy, is it is it exciting and fun. Uh, it's just like this, just this spontaneous romp. And uh, it's not something that you will you will hear these days. Uh, so for that reason, uh, I, I think this one, if you love the Symphony Fantastique, this one is, is definitely one to seek out. Okay, now that was easy. Why, why couldn't Beethoven have been like that? That just took us a couple of minutes, uh, Berlioz. So let's go now to Johannes Brahms, a German romantic composer. Uh, famously stood in the shadow of Beethoven, which is why his first symphony took very long for him to compose. And actually, of his symphonies, resembles Beethoven the most, uh, uh, particularly the end with, uh, he has this uh, sort of like a chorale, but it's with instruments, which sounds a little bit like the Ode to Joy. Uh, for this symphony, my top choice is Carrion with the Berlin Philharmonic, 1963. And uh, the reason I choose this one is uh, Carrion just had an innate understanding of how the music should go, uh, you know, the ebb and flow of it. Uh, it's dramatic, it's powerful, it's beautifully played. Uh, it's, it's probably the most focused and intense of his recordings of this piece. Uh, so for a first version of the first symphony, uh, this is the one that I, I would pick. That said, uh, there are more dramatic versions around, uh, particularly this one. Now, this is a little bit of sort of the, the other end of the spectrum. It is more dramatic. It is also more idiosyncratic, a little bit more eccentric, uh, but, uh, particularly the chorale theme at the very end of the symphony. Uh, he, he kind of broadens that in a way that uh, might be jarring if you're not used to it. But the thing about Bernstein, though, is it's so passionate uh, and exciting. Uh, and he was so rhythmic that uh, this is also, uh, in my opinion, an essential version. Uh, Vienna Philharmonic, uh, this was recorded in 1983, so it's got excellent sound quality. Uh, that actually does come from a, uh, a complete cycle, as does the carry-in of Brahms' symphonies. Um, 
I don't know if I would recommend the others in that cycle. Again, he was a little bit eccentric and idiosyncratic, but for this symphony, it's worth at least hearing uh, because of the, you know, it's such a, a powerful dramatic symphony that uh, it's, it's definitely worth hearing the Bernstein. Here's a conductor we have not talked about yet, Yasha Ornstein. Uh, this is with the London Symphony recorded in 1962. Ornstein is definitely one of the more patient school, the, the slow building. Uh, his recordings don't always, they're not always immediately ear catching or appealing, but if you have the patience to listen through them, he has this way of, of building powerful climaxes that is really unique. Uh, and in, in this symphony, it really works well. It's also a very well recorded uh, studio performance. Now, of course, if we're talking, talking about patience and slow building power, you can't leave out Klemperer. This is with the Philharmonia recorded in 1957. Still sounds really good. Uh, Klemperer, nobody did those opening thunderous strokes that opens this symphony the way, the way Klemperer does. And of course, he's got that relentlessness and that patience of the way he, he builds things. Um, the one thing I would say is that uh, compared to say, maybe you know carry on uh klemper he to my my opinion uh, not everyone shares this uh his brahms his brahms cycle is is one of the most celebrated complete cycles but to to my ear it, it, it his style works a little bit better in beethoven with brahms i want to hear a little bit more uh, a dynamic uh feel for the ebb and flow rhythmically uh, and the way Klemperer kind of moves more methodically like this, uh, to me, doesn't work quite as well in Brahms. Um, but it does work pretty well in the first symphony. Uh, and I would say the second as well, which, which I'll get to in, in a couple of moments. Um, now, those are my stereo studio recommendations. I also have to re recommend Fort Wengler in this one. And this is actually one of the most universally uh, uh, appealing of Fort Wenger issues. This is a live recording, 1951, uh, sounds great in this Tara issue. Uh, this is with the North German Radio Symphony and it's very well recorded, which is one of the reasons why it, it appeals to, uh, to a lot of people. And it's just so dramatic and so powerful, almost overwhelmingly so. Uh, so that's a talk, top recommendation. Uh, something a little different, though, is uh, uh, a recording from much further back. And this is Felix Wein Weingartner. Uh, this is with the London Symphony, recorded in 1939. It's from a complete cycle. And Weingartner is very different from Fort Wenger. My, Weingartner was not as, not, he, he, he didn't, uh, he wasn't as heavy. Uh, he was more uh, of a straight-laced conductor, um, but it was it was still very exciting, uh, and uh, you know it was it was sort of like the lean mean style uh, in, instead of the the more you know larger tubier ponderous style you might say. Uh, Weingartner actually knew Brahms and actually performed for Brahms, so that's that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, but it's much more than that. These these are. Uh, excellent recordings, and uh, they're they're a little bit different from what we're we're used to today. But um, it's definitely an, an artistic vision that is worth seeking out if you love Brahms. So that is the first symphony. Uh, now let's go to his second symphony. The second symphony is almost like Brahms's past pastoral symphony. Uh, it's not programmatic, but it. It does have that feeling of tranquility about it, um, maybe helped by the fact that the first movement actually utilizes his famous lullaby theme, you know, dun, da, da, dun, da, 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 um, which actually is part of the reason why my top choice is Klemperer with a Philharmonia from 1956. Not because it's leisurely, but because of the opposite reason, because Klemperer doesn't let it become just like sleepy and boring. Klemperer actually gives it this feeling of oomph and power uh, that in, in my mind makes it even more interesting. Um, so th this is a, a wonderful version of the second and I think the strongest uh, of uh, Klemperer's cycle. Um, 
another strong version uh, of the second symphony, and this one is a little bit more lush, uh, is uh, Carrie Ann's uh, digital version. Uh, this was recorded in, uh, what was it, 1983, I think, uh, with the Berlin Philharmonic, and it's just uh, very lush and very beautiful sounding while also being powerful and dramatic. So that's a strong version. Another strong one, uh, very famous, is Bruno Walter, who was a wonderful Brahmsian. This is from his complete cycle uh, with the Columbia Symphony, which is a very consistently good uh, cycle. Uh, the second, uh, with Walter, similar to the Pastoral Symphony of Beethoven, is, is that he had this warmth and gentleness to him. Uh, but still, you know, he also was very, uh, very rhythmic. So it's it's not like you know dull. However, if you want to hear something really exciting, you should seek out his mono version. Uh, this is from his mono cycle uh, with the New York Philharmonic uh, in the early '50s. Uh, this one, the final movement, uh, which is a really exciting movement with a great ending. Uh, this one is one of the, uh, you know, the, the most exciting around. So this just goes to show the difference that you have, uh, you know, when you go from earlier Bruno Walter to his later, more familiar. Uh, certainly the one on Columbia is better recorded and it's got that warmth and everything, you know, to it. But, but this one is also, you know, definitely worth seeking out. However, uh, we also have uh, Pierre Monteux. He was very well known for the Brahms second. Uh, just this, he also had this, this warmth about him, this sunniness. Uh, he, uh, the London Symphony sounds great in this recording. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it, it shares a lot of qualities with the Bruno Walter recording, uh, in, in terms of, uh, just this eloquence that he brought to it. However, like Bruno Walter, there is an earlier Monta, and this one is actually a live recording. It's it's kind of variable in sound. It's a little bit uh, it's a little bit more limited. But this is with the San Francisco Symphony from 1951, and this one there's extra energy. I and mean, this one actually is to me is is one of the best Brahms seconds around. Uh, it combines all the qualities of warmth, eloquence, excitement. So if you can stand the sound quality, I I recommend this one. But not to be outdone, we also have a live recording from Fort Wenger from uh, 1945 with the Vienna Philharmonic that, like the Bruno Walter that I just mentioned, has a very exciting finale. Uh, and then with Fort Wenger, you, you have all of the, you know, the, the eloquence, the drama, uh, the, the beauty of phrasing. Uh, it is a very limited recording in terms of sound quality. It's, it's somewhat noisy. But uh, the interpretation is one of the, one of the best, uh, one of the best around. Okay, so that's the second symphony. Now we come to the Brahms third, which is personally my favorite. It's the first one that I got to know, and it's it's just such a beautiful, colorful symphony. The third movement has maybe the the most appealing uh, theme that Brahms ever wrote. You know the da 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 di da 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 di da da. So for this one, uh, we have one that for me is kind of, kind of a slam dunk choice actually, uh, because of the recording quality and the interpretation. This one is from Claudio Abbado. This is with the Berlin Philharmonic, recorded in 1989. This is part of a complete cycle, which. Uh, in my opinion, if you want a good sounding, complete Brahms cycle, uh, Abado is the one to go for. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's wonderful. Everything is wonderfully, beautifully phrased, uh, but it's got great energy, great drama to it as well. The third movement is perfect. <laughs> in my opinion, not everyone may share that. Is, is, uh, some people may think it's a little bit too much on the lush side, on the slow side, um, but for my money, I, I've played this for many people, and you know, when I'm introducing them to classical music, I often play them this this theme from the Third Symphony, and this is the one I play them. And they're just like, "Oh, it's so gorgeous!" So this is really great. Um, also, we have I'm not sure if I've discussed this conductor yet. I probably have not. Eugen Jochum. Uh, this is with the London Symphony. It was recorded in 1976. 
also part of a complete cycle, also a very consistently good cycle. Uh, Jochum was a specialist in the German Romantic repertoire. Uh, he was very flexible in the way he conducted. Um, and uh, it's, it's very lush, very beautiful, uh, just wonderfully phrased and very exciting. This third is, is probably the best one from his cycle. Uh, the way he launches out of the gate at the beginning, it's, it's one of the most exciting uh, that I've heard. Uh, another great third is, uh, we just discussed the second from Bruno Walter. Let's talk about the third. Uh, this is a very famous interpretation, and this is one where if you do want that third movement to move a little bit more, uh, Bruno Walter does give you that. In fact, the whole symphony, there's this energy and sparkle that he performs with, and that's probably why this is such a, a famous recording. And it's got the warmth, uh, and it, it really is it's a wonderful interpretation. Uh, sounding excellent in uh, 19, what is it, 19, I think it's like 1960, 1960 stereo. <coughs> However, the third, oh, it's such a great symphony. I got to mention a few more. Uh, one, this is also from 1960, and this is also from a complete cycle. This is Rudolf Kempe with a Berlin Philharmonic. Uh, it's a little bit hard to find. It's on Testament. And uh, Kempe was just a very n natural Brahmsian. Uh, he did a, a great requiem uh, in the 50s. Uh, and then he also recorded this cycle uh, with the Berlin Philharmonic. Uh, some of them are in mono. This one is a stereo recording of the third. Um, and it's really one of the best sets around. And if you want to hear just sort of old school German Brahms, but very uh, affectionate and, and, uh, and, and great energy and warmth, uh, this is a great version. Uh, another version from the same year again, 1960, good year for Brahms thirds, is Carrion with the Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, this was recorded uh, for Decca. And uh, this is just a beautiful, beautiful recording. Uh, the, the sound en engineering is great for its time. The Vienna Philharmonic uh, sounds wonderful. Uh, and Carrion, this is just one of his, his better uh, interpretations of Brahms in that it's very focused and uh, very, you know, it's got great warmth and great beauty and drama and just, you know, he knew, he just knew, he was a natural Brahmsian. He just knew what the music should do. A um, couple more of the third. This one is from 1955. Here's a, here's a conductor we've not talked about, Guido Cantelli. Now, Cantelli was uh, a conductor who unfortunately died young uh, before he really, you know, could hit his stride. So we only have a few recordings by him. Uh, but this third, it's a little bit maybe understated, but there's this this beautiful glow about it, this this naturalness about it. It's it is in stereo. Uh, it's not as full and and detailed and uh, as as a, a more modern recording might be, but it still sounds really good. And it's it's just a sort of like this just this very um, immaculately beautiful recording. Uh, I don't know how else to put it. it. It It's just got this glow about it, even though it's not the most dramatic uh, sounding Brahms third. Uh, it's it's still very appealing and, and a, a great one if you want, if, if you love this symphony. And then finally, I will uh, also recommend another Furtwängler. And this one is a little bit more controversial. A lot of people say that this is the weak link in his Brahms. This is the 1954 Berlin Philharmonic recording, which by the way, uh, all of Furtwängler's best Brahms ha is collected into a set uh, that was issued by Music and Arts. Uh, so if you want them all together, that, that is definitely a more economic way to collect them. Uh, I've mentioned this one, that's a Deutsche Grammophon. The second is also on Deutsche Grammophon, which means you can find them in this box, which I recommended earlier. Um, Otherwise, I got this single version. It's like a, a Japanese version. Uh, why, is it, why is it controversial? It's controversial probably because uh, for this symphony, which in some ways people might argue plays itself, you don't want to tinker with it too much. For Wenger, of course, it brings more drama uh, and fluctuation to it, but it, it just works so well. I mean, it really is one of the most exciting 
powerful Brahms thirds I've heard, and that third movement is just so beautiful in the way he phrases it. Uh, and it's a pretty good sounding live recording uh, for 1954. So I, I, as controversial as it might be to some, I still recommend that one. All right, so we've got one more Brahms symphony to go, and that is the fourth, uh, which uh, for a lot of people was his, his greatest symphony. And it may be because it was the least conventional, the most mercurial. Uh, it's certainly very dramatic. It, it starts with this wonderful theme in the strings. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. And it's really pretty. Uh, I'm not going to be very controversial in my, my choice for this one. Let's see, where did it go? Here it is. Carlos Kleiber, Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, this one is just, uh, it, it, it's dramatic, it's, it's just immaculately phrased. Uh, it, it, to me, it's, it's just the best all-around version. Uh, very well recorded, maybe a little bit, you know, some people say thin. Uh, I've heard, you know, it's an early digital recording. It was made in 1980. Uh, doesn't bother me personally. Uh, this is still, for me, the, the first Brahms fourth that I, that I, uh, that I pick. Um, but if you do want maybe a little bit more lushness, a little bit more uh, a fuller sound, uh, you can go with the Bado, the Berlin Philharmonic. Uh, this is also a great recording, very exciting. Um, I love in that second movement, then when that theme, that, that lush theme, the low strings come, Abado, uh, comes, Abado does a great job with that. Here's someone we have not discussed yet, a, a conducting giant of the mid-20th century, Fritz Reiner. Now, he was known for his Chicago Symphony recordings. This is actually with the Royal Philharmonic uh, in 1962. And he was rumored to say that this was his most beautiful recording. Um, it's a very unaffected, natural recording. Uh, and if, if you like, uh, if you like the, your, your uh, symphonies to sound unforced, like there's not an interpreter, you know, kind of... Uh, pushing him in a certain direction, Reiner is an excellent choice for that. It could be a little bit more dramatic in that final movement, uh, but it is consistent with the approach as, as a whole and definitely worth seeking out. All right, for, now I'm going to end with a few historical uh, uh, versions of the fourth. Again, uh, Fort Wenger. He was very well known for his fourth. Um, pretty much, he's. I think he had like four... Uh, uh, live versions. He didn't have a, a studio version, and they're all good, really. Uh, the one that he did in the uh, during the war. Uh, this is again part of this box set, 1943. It's also in the music and arts box set. Uh, that one is very dramatic and powerful. I actually think this one is even better. This is his 1949 uh, live version with the Berlin Philharmonic, recorded in Wiesbaden. Wiesbaden, Germany, and this was part of a concert that included a, a fantastic Mozart 40th symphony as well. And Fritz Wenger was just known for his the, the incredible drama and excitement that he brought to this symphony. There's actually a video clip you can find on YouTube of him conducting the the final moments, uh, the coda of the uh, the final movement, which was a little controversial because he has this really he really speeds it up towards the end. But I I think it works. I know some people uh, some people don't, but it really is a unique uh, dramatic vision that he brings to this piece. Uh, another great version, and again a contrast with Fort Wenger, again, is the Weingartner uh, recording. This was made, uh, I think it was in 1938, again with the London Symphony. It's more streamlined. Uh, it's not as overtly dramatic, but uh, there's a, a discipline to it, and uh, it, it's really, there's an earnestness to the way Weingartner approaches Brahms that, to me, uh, is make, makes it still valuable even after all this time has passed. You know, definitely it's a, it's a limited sound quality, but uh, it is definitely worth seeking out. However, let's not leave out Toscanini. This is with the BBC Symphony. This was recorded in 1935, and uh, it's very dramatic as you would expect with Toscanini, but it's it's also very passionate. Uh, it, it really sings. In fact, you can even hear Toscanini himself singing <laughs> along. Uh, you know, Toscanini, he was known as an as a, a authoritarian, a, a disciplinarian, uh, but he was also passionate about the music. I mean, he, he loved the music, and, and that does come out. 
Uh, and it definitely comes out in this Brahms fourth. Okay, that is Brahms. Now let's discuss Bruckner, Anton Bruckner, uh, a, a German, sorry, an Austrian composer of the late Romantic era. And Bruckner wrote these massive long symphonies. Uh, and they're a little bit difficult to get into at first, uh, but once you do, they're very rewarding. Uh, it can almost sound sometimes like Bruckner is just meandering and that it's, you know, you wonder where is this going? And, and it really does take a lot of skill as a conductor to, to maintain uh, the interest uh, because it's, it's just a lot to take in at once. Uh, his f first really popular symphony is uh, probably the fourth. Uh, I'd say the fourth and the seventh, they're, they're a little bit shorter comparatively, uh, and they're more maybe, you know, tuneful. Uh, so the fourth is nicknamed the Romantic. And my top recommendation for this one is Carl Baim and the Vienna Philharmonic. This is a 1974 recording on Decca. Sounds beautiful. It, it's just it, it's just uh, very natural and powerful in the way it builds. Uh, you know, Baim just lets the symphony do its thing. And um, I, I think that this particular recording is, is the strongest one for the fourth in the way it's, it's just, um, it's just so, you know, natural. <laughs> However, um, you can also uh, um, get the Eugen Jochum recording with the Berlin Philharmonic. This is from 1965. And this is from a complete cycle that Jochum did. Uh, one of the best cycles around, uh, that along with, I would say, uh, Carrion, the Berlin Philharmonic. And uh, Jochum is a little bit more, uh, you might say, interventionist. He flexes the tempo a little bit more, a little bit more dramatic. And, and that has its own special qualities. And, but he's also very poetic as well. Just a, a really natural uh, Bruckner uh, conductor. Now, for something a little different, and maybe for some a little more <coughs> controversial, is Sergio Celidi Bach, Celibi Dache. It's very hard to pronounce. Um, Celibi Dache, or Celli, as he's uh, sometimes nicknamed. Um, Celibi Dache, uh, this is with the Munich Philharmonic. It was recorded in 1988. It is a live recording. Uh, I think there is some audience noise, but it is, uh, otherwise, it's a, a very good recording quality. Um, he recorded, he, he conducted in a way that was, it was almost like a, a zen-like, transcendental-like, uh, like there was this, he, he tended to slow things down. And there was this feeling of this long arc uh, from beginning to end uh, that uh, can be uh, hip, hypnotic in its own way. Uh, at the same time, there's a lack of variation uh, that uh, may be unsettling for some people, uh, or definitely uh, uh, not conventional. It tends to work better in Bruckner, probably because of, of Bruckner's compositional style. Uh, and I think especially it works well in, in this fourth. Uh, it's a very powerful experience, however unconventional it may be. And finally, we come, uh, here he is again, Fort Wengler. Uh, this is a live concert from, uh, this was in Munich with the Vienna Philharmonic, October 29th, 1951. He also had one in Stuttgart from a week earlier that you can find, again, in this box here. Uh, and that one is good. Yeah, this one is good. I think it's, it's a little bit less inspired. And for Wenger, when he was off, sometimes he would do things, you know, he was so flexible that when he was off, he would do, flex, when he, let's say, he, when he was on, he would do things that just sound like, oh, that's the only way the music could go. Whereas other times it could sound a little strange. And I would say that's the case of this earlier recording, the one from a week earlier. Whereas this one, it's a little bit more patient, not as frenetic. And it's very powerful. Uh, Fruchner, uh, Fruchner, <laughs> Fort Wengler was a very, uh, uh, he was well known for his Bruckner. Uh, some would argue that Bruckner was the close to, closest to his heart uh, because it, it certainly was the closest to his own uh, compositional style. Fort Wengler actually was a composer himself. Uh, and Bruckner was closer to Fort Wengler in terms of, you know, time-wise as well. 
uh, and he just he just had this understanding of of where the music should go, and that's really important in Bruckner, where it's the the, the it's it's so uh, dense the writing. Uh, that you really need a conductor with that understanding. So uh, this one is a great recommendation. It is uh, limited in you know sound quality, of course. In fact, all of Furvanger's Bruckner recordings were recorded live, and they're of variable sound quality. All right, now let's talk about the fifth. The fifth, um, this one is a little bit more mercurial, uh, and it's really only relatively lately that it's been gaining in popularity it takes a lot of patience it's it's less tuneful less you know immediately appealing um this is a symphony where i think the symphonic argument it it, it kind of does its own work and you need a lot of patience in the way you pace this one and that's what we get from bernard heitink this is with the Bavarian Radio Symphony Orchestra. This is recorded in 2010, so not that long ago. And it sounds gorgeous. The playing is gorgeous. The sound quality is gorgeous. And Heitink was a conductor who conducted a lot uh, over many decades, mainly with the Concertgebouw. Um, he was not a flashy conductor. Uh, he was not a conductor who imposed his will. He was more of a patient conductor. Sometimes people, you know, would say a little bit on the boring side, you might say, because he wasn't so flashy. But this is a recording where that really works wonderfully. Uh, th this, I, I'm just captivated every time I hear this. And, and uh, that's what you want with this symphony. The, the payoff comes at the very end where it, it almost... The, the closing bars make sense of everything you've been listening to. Uh, you know, you, you, you're left wondering, you know, when you, you're first listening to it, it's like, where is this going? And then finally at the end, it's like, ah, ah, here we go. That, that's the genius of Bruckner. And that's what you get here. Another conductor who was very good with the Bruckner Fifth, we've already discussed, is Eugen Jochum. This is from uh, 1964. It was recorded live at the Otto Buren Abbey. Uh, but the, the sound quality is excellent, almost like a, a studio recording. This is with the Concertgebouw Orchestra. And again, it's, it's another uh, patient reading. Uh, he, lets the, he lets the drama build. Uh, it's maybe a little bit more overt than Heitink is, especially at the very end. Uh, so for that reason, it might be appealing. However, with Jochum, we have to also discuss his recording from a couple of decades later, this is a live recording from 1986 with the Concertgebouw. And this is really one of a kind. Uh, it's uh, very expansive. It, that's why it spills onto two discs. But this one is just almost overwhelming. Uh, you almost can, cannot listen to it that many times. I mean, it, it's already so long as it is. <laughs> but he just milks everything. And it's, 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 it's really a draining experience and, and one of the great... Uh, Bruckner recordings. And then finally, uh, I have another Furtwängler Bruckner recording. This is from 1942 with the Berlin Philharmonic. Uh, it sounds pretty good. It's pretty clear recording quality. Uh, this is a testament issue. It's also in the Deutsche Grammophon box as well. Uh, Furtwängler actually uh, conducts this piece a little bit faster, uh, but it's it's got his inimitable uh, uh, Bruckner phrasing and eloquence, especially the, the slow movement is just gorgeous. Uh, and it's, it's well worth seeking out if you love the Bruckner fifth. Okay, now on to the seventh and one of Bruckner's most, most popular symphonies. Uh, very appealing, uh, great, uh, gr uh, you know, it, it's, it's, got, uh, it's got this great scherzo for one thing, uh, bom, 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 bom. Uh, but then the, the rest of it too, it's, it's just, it's just gorgeous. It, it may be the best Bruckner symphony to introduce someone uh, to Bruckner with. And my uh, top choice for this one is Carrion with the Berlin Philharmonic. Uh, the seventh really was, I think, a, a Carrion's, it was really a Carrion specialty. Uh, there is this one that was recorded in 1975. There's also a 1971 uh, version that's on EMI. 
uh, that uh, is also very good. And then he has one with the Vienna Philharmonic from 1988. Uh, I'd say this one is my top choice uh, because it's the most it's the most dramatic. Uh, the scherzo is just out of this world, uh, and the recording is is it's just excellent. This comes from a complete cycle, which alongside the Jochum, I would say is the top. Uh, Bruckner cycle if you want to get a Bruckner cycle uh, and it, it's, it's just wonderful uh, but the EMI is also great it's a little bit more a little bit more mellow compared to this one but it's got this ethereal quality to it this great atmosphere and then there's the Vienna which a lot of people they, they um, prefer that one I, I think you know that was during his last years and I can see how some people say that Carrie Ann uh, attained maybe this more ref, uh, reflective uh, mode uh, in those years. Uh, to me, I prefer the, the greater energy and drama of his earlier recordings. Uh, but the Vienna is certainly a very good one and it's got great recording quality, you know, great detail. And if you want to explore more Carrie Ann uh, Bruckner, definitely I would uh, not dissuade you from checking that one out as well. Um, there also is an excellent recording from, again, Heitink. This one is with the Concertgebouw, uh, his home orchestra for most of his conducting career. This is from 1978, and I just love this cover. Isn't, isn't that great? Look at that. That's a great cover. Um, again, Heitink uh, tends to be unforced, natural. He just lets the music happen, and uh, the Concertgebouw uh, just sounds gorgeous. The sound quality is gorgeous. Uh, that's a top choice. Uh, similar qualities, I would say, are uh, uh, you, you would find with the BAME recording, with the Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, this is from 1976, I believe. And again, gorgeous playing, gorgeous sound quality. It sounds very, uh, very natural. It's, it's a very, very noble uh, interpretation. Uh, it's, it's not as, uh, you know, I would say overtly, you know, dramatic as uh, as Carrie Ann is, but it's 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 got it's it's definitely got its own qualities. Uh, I would say similar things about this recording. This is a digital recording, 1984, uh, Ricardo Chai with the Berlin Radio Symphony Orchestra. Uh, this is uh, this is a a slightly more understated recording, but um, it's got this this beautiful ethereal quality to it and. Uh, the sound quality is so good that th this is definitely a recording to seek out. However, for the seventh, I have to go back to Fort Wenger. Uh, like Carrie Ann, uh, Fort Wenger was, uh, he, he just knew how to, to just bring that drama uh, full throttle. And uh, the seventh was one of his best interpretations. He had uh, three live recordings uh, and it's hard really to choose between any of the three of them. Um, this is the Rome recording from May 1st, 1951. Uh, they're all, I think they're all three of them with the Berlin Philharmonic. Uh, he also has one that's in that DG box uh, that was recorded in Cairo, uh, like I think a week earlier. And then there's another one from 1949 uh, that's on EMI. Uh, he brought great drama, great beauty of phrasing, and then that adagio, oh wow. I mean, he just, he, he, that adagio has just such pathos and uh, it really packs an emotional wallop. Uh, that alone is worth uh, by itself seeking out the Fort Wenger versions. I wish I could say they were better recorded. Again, these are all recorded live and they're not the, the best quality, but from an interpretive standpoint, definitely worth seeking out. Okay, now we come to what I think is the, the greatest of the Bruckner symphonies, uh, certainly the most epic, and that is the eighth. Wow, this symphony is just uh, um, an experience. Uh, it, first of all, I have to talk about the adagio. Uh, it's maybe the most ad a beautiful adagio ever uh, composed. Um, and the, the whole thing is just, it's just a masterpiece. Uh, I'm going to recommend a lot of recordings for this one. <laughs> um, first, I'm going to start with a conductor we've not discussed yet, but about a great Bruckenerian. This is Gunter Wand, and this is with the Berlin Philharmonic, recorded live in 2001. 
And Vond was like Heitink, another uh, conductor that wasn't as flashy, but he, he let the music unfold naturally. And that's what you get here. It's just this beautiful eloquence uh, to this recording, this sort of inevitability to how, how everything unfolds. And the sound is just, it's just gorgeous, a very, uh, uh, very seductive, I would say, the sound on this recording, the sound of the orchestra uh, with the combination of, of, of uh, the, the majesty of this piece by Bruckner. Um, however, there is also an earlier Vond. Uh, this is recorded live with the North German Radio Symphony. Uh, this was live in 1987. But now I say there is another. He actually had lots of, uh, I, I don't know how many, but he had, he, he recorded a lot of Bruckner. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but this one is special for its, its, intensity uh it's got this this hushed intensity about it uh and and their dramatic moment the 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 big climaxes especially are really powerful in this one and maybe it was something about the the uh the cathedral uh it, it's it, it's a little bit cavernous the sound to be honest but it's there's this i don't know this something about it that's very alluring um so th this one what i'm trying to say is is this could easily be you know, take your pick between these two. They're, they are somewhat different and they have different, uh, you know, pros and cons. I, I would say just get both of these. Um, however, we have several others to recommend, one of which is maybe the most famous eight, and that is from Carrie However, not the one that everyone recommends. I recommend the Carrie from 1975. Again, part of his uh, Bruckner cycle that he did with the Berlin Philharmonic. And the reason I choose this one is Carrie brings to this symphony, first of all, this, this immaculate understanding of the architecture of it, um, of the powerful movements. Uh, you've got the beauty of the orchestra. And there's just this palpable um, uh, concentration and intensity to this version, which is why I favor this one over the, the more famous one, which is this one with the Vienna Philharmonic from 19, 1988. This is actually maybe Carrie-Anne's most celebrated recording he ever made. And I will say it is definitely a powerful one. And I understand the whole thing about, you know, it's, it's his last few years, it's his valedictory performance, and it's more spiritual and so on. I, I just think that it's a little bit lacking in energy and concentration compared to the, the earlier one. Just just my my opinion. They're both very good though. Um, now another conductor known for his Bruckner Eighth is Carlo Maria Giulini. This is with the Vienna Philharmonic. This is recorded in 1984, so it's got excellent digital sound. Giulini was one of these more uh, patient spiritual conductors, more you know, uh, long, longer, you know, more expansive, slower tempos, which works very well in the eighth and, and it has this power and majesty. Uh, so that's great. We also have Bame and the Vienna Philharmonic. And once again, I have to say about Bame, he has this way that just sounds natural. Uh, it, 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 the, the, the beauty of the Vienna Philharmonic, the sound quality, um, Sometimes I want to say that this this maybe should be the, the top choice for those reasons that you just you hear the the Bruckner eighth in all its glory uh, and uh, that's really all I can have to say about this one. Um, <clears throat> it's unfortunate we don't have a cycle of Bruckner from Bain because all his Bruckner was just was just wonderful. Now a couple of somewhat newer recordings. Um, I guess the '90s are now what three decades ago, so maybe not that new. But I still like think of the '90s as coming as kind of recent. This is 19. Uh, I think it's 1996. This is Pierre Boulez with the Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, this is has great sound, and uh, the the interpretation is one that I think is is particularly if if for you Bruckner uh, if. You know, you think sometimes Bruckner can kind of be meandering and you kind of wonder where it's going. Uh, Boulez's interpretation is very alert. Uh, it's not like super fast or anything like that, but it's very incisive, very sharp, very tight. And it's, it's just very powerful while also being musical and beautiful. So those are the virtues of that one. Maybe a, I'd say a light, somewhat different from that is what you get from Christian Tielemann. 
This is with the Vienna Philharmonic. By the way, what was it like? Six, seven Vienna Philharmonic recordings of the eighth uh, I'm recommending here. They really owned this piece. But this is from uh, 20, what is it? 2019, I believe, 2018 or 2019. And uh, Tielemann is more of a, uh, a slow, slow building. He, he, again, one of those that doesn't like hit you over the head. Um, but there is a difference to the sound with, with Tielemann. It's more round, less like incisively sharp. And he was a master at, at, or sorry, was, is. I'm so used to all these dead conductors, I forget. Tailman, actually, I saw him conduct the Bruckner 8th just uh, last October with the, with the Chicago Symphony. And that was memorable, not just for being an amazing performance, but I uh, then proposed to my, my now wife after the concert. So <laughs> maybe I have a personal reason for recommending this. But I I do have to say Tailman had, had has a special way, uh, especially the way he builds these climaxes very patiently, very powerfully. Uh, he is also a Wagner specialist, so that, that plays into it as well. Um, so that is definitely a recent recording worth seeking out. However, you know I have to go back to Fort Wenger, and in this case, I really mean it. <laughs> this is, for me, the Desert Island Bruckner 8th and one of the Desert Island symphony recordings overall that I, I, I know of. This is his Vienna Philharmonic 1944 recording. And, and one thing about this one is uh, the sound is actually really good for 1944. Uh, it, it's not uh, fuzzy at all. It's, it's fairly clear. Uh, it's, it's not going to be as full as a modern recording, of course, but it's, it's pretty good. And, and this one is just, again, just one of those intense hypnotic performances where the, the orchestra and Furt Wengler are just in this zone. It's, it's like they know exactly what they're doing. And it's, you know, every, every phrase is imbued with emotion. And it's, it's just a devastating performance. Uh, definitely one that you have to hear. So that is the Bruckner 8th. Now let's go to Bruckner's final symphony, the Ninth. Uh, the Ninth is uh, a, a symphony that Bruckner actually did not complete. It ends with the third movement, Adagio. But I tell you, in my opinion, that's enough. <laughs> it's, it's just a masterpiece, and it's, it's already so ever, overwhelming, I, I don't know how he could top it. I, I, now, I know there are some like fragments that he left, and there have been some attempted completions. Uh, they've never been... Uh, convincing to me, uh, but certainly you can you can uh, check those out. Uh, but for the traditional three movement version, um, this is another one of those kind of slam dunk recommendations because it comes in uh, a digital sound quality. This is Giolini and the Vienna Philharmonic from 1988, uh, and this is just one of the greatest Bruckner recordings uh, ever made. Um, this fit Giolini like a glove. This this symphony, uh, with his, his his spiritual way of of, of conducting in, in a very you know patient and allowing things to build, and, and this is just it's just overwhelming, awe inspiring. This recording it really is, um, and the playing is beautiful and the sound quality is beautiful. I really have nothing else to say. They get this. <laughs> um, however, there are also some other great. Uh, versions of this this great symphony and uh, one of them is Gunter Wand who again I have two recordings to recommend uh, this again is Berlin Philharmonic this is from 19, 1998 and then this one again is from the Lübeck Cathedral with the North German Radio Symphony Orchestra this came from 1988 and the virtues are similar to what you got with the eighth this one has the beautiful plane of, of the Berlin Philharmonic uh, Vaughn's interpretation, his his patience, his uh, uh, knowledge of, of just where to go, it's just a, a wonderful interpretation and it, it really makes sense of the symphony in, in a unique way. And then this one it has that, that hushed intensity, that atmosphere that uh, I, you know, must have been from that live recording they had in, in the Lübeck Cathedral. Uh, there is, I think, a video of this floating around. I've seen it off and on around on YouTube. Um, very dramatic, very powerful. Both of these are, are wonderful. Uh, we also have, again, Carrie Ann, and again, it's his 
mid-70s Berlin Philharmonic recording that I think is the best. Um, he, he did have one from, I think it was like 1966 with Berlin on Deutsche Grammophon that uh, is very famous uh, for its power and intensity. Um, some people prefer that one. I think that this one, uh, it was, it's even a stronger, more defined performance. Uh, and it, you know, what else do you want in this symphony? It's, it's powerful, it's, it's dramatic. Um, you get the, the full carry on with this one. Uh, however, we also have another Berlin Philharmonic recording and this time from the 90s. This is Daniel Barenboim. Uh, Barenboim actually recorded three separate Bruckner cycles with three different orchestras. Uh, one in the, I think it was mainly in the 70s or maybe all in the 70s, that's with the Chicago Symphony. Then he had this one the Berlin, with the Berlin Philharmonic, uh, which is in digital. And I think that's around, around this time period, 1990, maybe late 80s, early 90s, I think. And then a more recent one with the Staatskapelle, uh, it's a Berlin Staatskapelle. I can't, believe, I, I can't remember if it's the Dresden or Berlin. I think it's the Berlin Staatskapelle. Anyways. I think it's this middle cycle, the Berlin cycle, that is his strongest. It's the best combination of orchestra and conductor being on the top of their game. And this is just a, a, a really good Bruckner ninth. It just sounds very natural and inevitable. Uh, the, the power of the, of the, uh, of the interpretation uh, just builds slowly, it builds naturally. Uh, and, and it's got this sound about it that I, I don't know how to define it. Uh, it's, it's like this rounded Bruckner sound that just sounds right for Bruckner. So this is an excellent Bruckner night. Um, also, we have a more recent one. This is from 2018. This is Manfred Honig with the Pittsburgh Symphony. The sound quality on this one is incredible. You have a dynamic range, which is just you know amazing. Uh, so that's definitely a plus in this favor. Uh, it's this one has, uh, you know, so it's got the, the wonderful climax is very incisive. Uh, everything is immaculately phrased. Uh, and then, you know, because of the dynamic range, especially you have just these hushed pian uh, pianos. So this is definitely, if you're looking for a recent recording uh, and looking for something from Manfred Honig, who is sort of like the, the hot thing today among conductors, uh, this is definitely, uh, definitely worth seeking out. A couple of vintage recordings. This one is a conductor we have not discussed yet. This is Hans Knappertsbusch. Uh, he was uh, mainly a Wagner specialist, or mainly known as a Wagner specialist, but that, of course, lends itself very well to Bruckner. This is a live recording, January 30th, 1950. I mentioned the exact date because he did a studio recording two days earlier, also with the Berlin Philharmonic. Uh, that one obviously has an appeal for, for being a, a better sound quality. This one's a little bit noisy, but I think this one shows him at his most inspired and it is just so, it, it's just dramatic and um, uh, uh, emotional. He, he has this way of thrusting back and forth, uh, which, you know, is, um, you, you don't really see that a lot these days. Uh, so this is, if, if you're interested in exploring the Berkner Ninth more, this is really worth seeking out. And then finally, we have yet again, Fort Finger, and yet again a wartime recording, this time with the Berlin Philharmonic. It was right about the same time as that uh, eighth with the Vienna uh, from 1944. And again, you know, we can only speculate that maybe towards the end of the war, especially, that there were, you know, heavy emotions that were playing into it. But it's just a, a super intense recording, uh, almost apocalyptic, uh, this version of the ninth. Um, the sound quality is not quite as good as the eighth, but it's pretty good. Um, and I, I do want to mention that this ninth, as well as the eighth, are also both in this box set as well. So I, I can't say enough. If you're interested in Fort Wenger, uh, th this is a, a, a good investment to make. Uh, this issue is from Praga Digitals, which is something that has only recently uh, come up. And um, they're supposed to have better sound quality. Um, they sound good to me. Uh, I mean, I'll be honest, when you're talking about something that was recorded in the 1940s, I mean, 
how much improvement can you get? But you know, yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's some for some people it's worth it. Um, on that topic, I will mention that the the eighth, there is an issue by I, th I think it's called Musica Concepts that I, I will say that does sound like an improvement on the other transfers I've heard. Anyways, that is the ninth, and that is Bruckner. So let's now move off of the letter B. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, move on to uh, the letter D, uh, Dvorak. Dvorak, uh, Antonin Dvorak, uh, was a Czech composer uh, who was kind of similar to Brahms, uh, late Romantic, uh, you know, mid to late Romantic, uh, very colorful. Uh, he also uh, uh, kind of used these themes that uh, are bohemian. Uh, and uh, his seventh symphony is the first one I'm going to discuss. And actually, this one has been thought of as sort of a Brahmsian-like uh, symphony. Uh, very, very tuneful, a lot of fun. Um, and the recording that I recommend for this one is, it comes from a complete cycle. And this one is from Nime Yervi with the Scottish National Orchestra. This is a digital recording from 1986. And the reason I, re I recommend this one is um, there is just this, um, there's this lushness to it, this beautiful sound, and this sort of spontaneity. Uh, it, it, it just has this way of, to me, it sells me on the work un unlike any other. Um, there's a little bit of a, of a darkness to it, um, and that's, that's what I like about it. Not the only way to, to perform it, but for me, it works. A slightly maybe different way of, of doing it is this one. It's a little bit more, more sparkling, a little bit uh, more incisive, and very dramatic. This is from Carlos Paita, uh, sort of an obscure conductor among recordings. Uh, in fact, this is issued on his own label called Lodia. This is uh, a 1982 digital recording, and it's just really exciting. Um, so that's another way to hear it. Uh, for a recording from a little further back, although sounding pretty good, we have Pierre Monteux. Uh, and this is a wonderful interpretation. This is with the London Symphony. It was recorded in 19, uh, 1959, I believe. And uh, it's, it's kind of ironic that I mentioned this uh, as being sort of a Brahmsian-like symphony because Monteux was an excellent Brahmsian. And this shares a lot of the same qualities with his great Brahms second. Uh, it's it's just very um, uh, uh, very very beautiful. Uh, this kind of sunny atmosphere, very eloquent, uh, and you can't go wrong with this one. And the playing is beautiful, and the sound quality is not bad for 1962. However, I have to mention this historical historical recording. Uh, from way back in 19, let's see, what was it, 1937, 1938, I think. This is from the Czech conductor Vaclav Talich with the Czech Philharmonic. And this is just exciting as hell. I mean, they just play this like, you know, like to the manner born. Uh, it's, it's, it's got this spontaneity about it, like almost like they performed it a million times and they're just having, you know, a blast with it. Uh, it's, of course, it's not the best sound quality it's very limited being from the 1930s but if you if you love the uh, the sorry not the Brahms, the dvorak seventh uh, you really you really should hear tallage so that's the dvorak seventh now we go to the eighth which again is another uh symphony of dvorak that's just colorful has wonderful tunes uh, great atmosphere <clears throat> and my favorite recording for this one is Sir John Barbaroli with the Halle Orchestra. This is from 1957. Um, it's not the best sound quality, but it's pretty good, pretty good stereo. And the reason I choose this one is, and this is true of so much of, of Barbaroli, who we're gonna hear a lot more about Barbaroli as we go on. It's, it's the character of this. Uh, Barbaroli was a very passionate conductor. Uh, there's a great video of him um, rehearsing the, the beginning of that scherzo from the Bruckner 7th, the one that goes bum, 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 bum. And he just keeps having them do it again and again and again and again. It's not because he wants them to be more technically accurate. He's talking about the character of how they're playing it. That's what, for him, what he wanted to be precise about. And 
this Dvorak eighth is is just so atmospheric. It sounds like you're you you've been transported to Bohemia. There's that wonderful third movement. Ba 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 bum ba ba bum 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 ba ba bum 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 ba ba bum 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 bum, and it's just just beautiful. Um, also really exciting. Now, another great recording of the eighth that is uh, very exciting and better recorded is Raphael Kubelik, Czech conductor who, who did a, a complete uh, Dvorak cycle, probably definitely one of the best Dvorak cycles along with his fellow, uh, well, not actually, not fellow, uh, well, Istvan Kertes, his fellow, I say Dvorak specialist, but actually Kertes was Hungarian, not Czech. Um, that cycle is with the London Symphony. This one is with the Berlin Philharmonic. And it's a 1966 recording, uh, very exciting, wonderfully played, and, and Kubulik just really understood Dvorak um, so well. Uh, so this, this, this is also a great eighth, as is the version from Carrion. Oh, let me find that one again. I did that one earlier. Here it is. Coupled with the Brahms Third, with the Vienna Philharmonic from 1961, and this is one of Carrie Ann's best early recordings, uh, where it's just supremely dramatic, uh, very lush, beautifully phrased. The recording quality is fantastic. The playing the Vienna, Vienna Philharmonic is fantastic. And if you love the Dvorak Eighth, you're going to love this version. And then finally, I go back once again to Tolich. Once again, if you want to hear a idiomatic Czech performance, uh, that just sounds so natural, you know, like like they've been playing this forever, uh, and has wonderful character, uh, spontaneity, and excitement. Talich is the one I'd go for if you want a his historical version. This one dates uh, from 1935. Definitely limited sound, uh, so it's not going to be your only one. All right, now on to the ninth Dvorak's. Uh, Definitely his most popular work. I, I I tend to agree that it's his masterpiece, and that's the ninth sym the, the the ninth symphony, the New World Symphony, it was called, and uh, obviously the most famous thing about it, uh, you know, especially if you, you know, people who are newbies to classical music, is that uh, second movement with the the uh, the core anglais. Anyways, uh, for this one, my top choice is from Istvan Kertes, who we just mentioned. But this one is actually his Vienna Philharmonic recording, not the one from the complete cycle. This is the one from 1961. And it's just got a beautiful atmosphere about it, a beautiful feeling of occasion. Uh, very exciting, very characterful, very, very, very charming. Um, this is one that I, I just think if you want to if you want a Dvorak ninth that just captures the feeling and the character of the piece this is the one that i i recommend first however there are many other great recordings of this wonderful piece one of them is the one i just mentioned rafael kubelik with the berlin philharmonic this was recorded in 1972 beautifully played wonderfully recorded uh and and kubelik just knew all the spots to hit in this music uh another very well played and recorded version and very dramatic is Kirill Kondrashin, Russian conductor. This is with the Vienna Philharmonic. This is recorded in 1979. It's an early digital version. And aside from the recording quality, which is wonderful, uh, this one just has great character and, and great excitement. Uh, that, that last movement is it's one of the best in all of the symphonic repertoire, right? And, and, and this one is just, uh, just a thrill. Um, another uh, one that is this this time from a, a Czech conductor who was also a Dvorak specialist, Carol Anschel. This is with the Czech Philharmonic, and I hate to use this overused word, but it it is idiomatic. It just sounds it has all this character that that you that's irreplaceable uh, when, with a Czech conductor and an orchestra, and um, at the recording quality. It's in 1961. Uh, stereo recording uh, still sounds really good. Uh, Czech, the Czech Philharmonic, it had this particular sound um, that uh, even with an older recording, 
it comes across it's it's got this vibrancy to it uh, that is unmistakable and uh, for the Dvorak you're definitely going to want to at least hear this one another vintage recording and this one is with the Berlin Philharmonic is from Ferenc Fritschoy Fritschoy uh, we discussed him with the the Beethoven Ninth uh, this is a really dramatic, almost kind of like a dark, menacing uh, version. Uh, Free Choi was such, uh, he was such an emotional conductor. Uh, unfortunately, he died fairly young. Uh, I think he died in like 1962. Uh, so we, we, we should have had more from him. Uh, but what we, what we do have from him is, is wonderful. And, and this is a great example of it. But finally, I want to mention one more version. This is from 1954. Vaclav Talich, again, Talich with the Czech Philharmonic. However, this one is in really good sound. It's even good sound for 1954, despite the fact that it's mono. To me, this is this is the Desert Island Dvorak Knight. This is the one that has all, it, it, it's just paced just right. It has that character, that, that unique Czech character that just sounds right from the beginning. Um, and despite uh, not being, you know, a, a digital digital recording, it's it's uh, it's still the one that I get the most pleasure from, uh, and and just so exciting that final movement. So, there you go. That is Dvorak. Now let's talk about César Franck, French composer. Uh, we're only going to cover one symphony and one recording of that symphony. That is the Symphony in D. It's a very colorful symphony. Uh, it's it's not one of those you know deep, heavy Germanic <laughs> symphonies. Uh, this one is more it's more tuneful, uh, and it's it's got that French charm. Uh, and the recording for this one that I recommend is no surprise Pierre Monteux and the Chicago. I'm sorry, did I say yeah yeah Chicago Symphony. Uh, this is recorded in 1961, uh, but it still sounds great. And Montu knew knew just how to pace this piece, uh, all you know, highlighting all the all the the different sections in a way that brings out the charm of the piece and the color. And that's all I really have to say about that one. Uh, pretty pretty obvious choice, although certainly there are others. And and if you want to point them out, feel free to in the comments. All right, now we are on to Joseph Haydn. Uh, sort of considered the father of the symphony from the classical era. And he should be the father of the symphony because he wrote 104 of them. And uh, the, the most popular ones are the, the final 12 that he wrote when he uh, visited London. And that's why they're called the London symphonies. And they're also uh, usually presented as a complete set. Uh, the version of this one is that I recommend is uh, not particularly controversial. This is Eugen Jochum with the London Symphony. Uh, this was recorded in the early 70s. And uh, Jochum, Jochum's version, uh, it's, it's got great warmth. Um, it's it's uh, you know very powerful when it needs to be, uh, beautiful when it needs to be. It's just a great uh, a way to get to know these symphonies. Um, as is the older version from Sir Thomas Beecham. This is with the Royal Philharmonic in the late 50s. Uh, and again, Beecham brings, he, he always brought great panache to pretty much everything he conducted. It's got charm and grace as well as power. Uh, the recording quality is pretty good. It's, it's a little bit, um, it's, it's not as full and beautiful as say the Jochum, uh, but it's still pretty good and, and definitely a great way to know these symphonies. Uh, another version, and this one is is maybe a little bit more, you know, quote unquote, controversial. Uh, this is the one from Nicholas Harnencourt. Uh, this is with the Concertgebouw. Uh, Harnencourt, well, we, we discussed earlier as being a period specialist. Well, this is with a modern orchestra, uh, but the thing about this one is it's just got great energy throughout. Uh, it's very sharp, very incisive. Uh, it's never boring. And maybe that's why to some people it's considered controversial because it's not as conventional. Um, I don't particularly agree with that. I think I think this is a great way to hear the Haydn symphonies. It's uh, everything just sounds so fresh in this recording. Uh, recording quality is excellent. It's from I think the like the late 80s, early 90s in general. So uh, definitely definitely recommendable. One more 
I have to recommend for Haydn. Uh, this one is a little older. This is from 1956, but in fairly good stereo. Not a conductor you hear about every day. Mogens Veldike. This is with the Vienna State Opera Orchestra. And actually, this is only the second half, the final six symphonies, numbers 99 through 104. And these are just great. They, they're, they're vigorous, powerful. They have this wonderful energy, this, this, this feeling of, of discovery. Um, so even though it's not a complete cycle and it's, it's uh, early stereo, it's, it's still one that I, that I wholeheartedly recommend. All right, that is Haydn. Now we come to a big one, Mahler. Oh, Mahler, wow. Uh, Mahler, like Bruckner, uh, his symphonies uh, tend to be very long, more difficult to get into. Uh, but oh wow! I mean, what a what a you know <laughs> unique composer Mahler was. Uh, you know, very uh, emotional, uh, almost you know, kind of depressing, especially his later symphonies. Uh, but just a real genius. Uh, used tended to use these enormous orchestras, and and like Bruckner, you need a, a conductor who's uh, who's really skilled. Uh, I'm going to talk about the first symphony uh, uh, to begin with, nicknamed the Titan. And this is one of Mahler's uh, most compact, maybe the most compact of his symphonies. Uh, so in a way, it's a little bit a little easier to get into. Um, and the first version that I'm going to discuss for this one is John Barbaroli. We just discussed him with the Vorjak. Now, for my money, you cannot do better than Barbaroli and Mahler. Uh, Barbaroli had this uh, way of conducting that that was he was very affectionate he was very in tune with the emotions and that's very important with Mahler uh, in, in my opinion Mahler doesn't do well with detached clinical conducting uh, you all you know not that you want someone who's just gonna you know fly off the handle and not be disciplined at all but Barbaroli like I was just discussing he was very precise when it came to getting the mood and the atmosphere just right getting the character of each piece just right. And that's what he did in Mahler. Now, there, there is this single version I have that I got off Dutton, the Dutton label. And this is his, his uh, version that he did with the Holly Orchestra from 1957. Uh, but EMI, no, I'm sorry, not EMI, Warner, the, who took over EMI, have done us a favor and they've collected all of Barbaroli's best sounding Mahler recordings into one set. Uh, this includes the first, the fifth, sixth, fifth, sixth, and the ninth, as well as the song cycles that he did with Janet Baker, which are also uh, you know must have for uh, lovers of Mahler. So you can get the first in either this or or the box, and it has the qualities I was just talking about: the the character, uh, this the sort of loving way of of of, of doing everything, uh, and and the emotion and drama. Uh, it's all there. Uh, the one thing I would say is that uh, uh, compared to the other recordings in, in this box, especially, it's not. It doesn't sound quite as good. It doesn't have quite the the fullness or presence. If you do want that in the first symphony, then I would recommend uh, the, the sort of conventional uh, recommendation for the first symphony, which is Raphael Kubelik with the Bavarian Radio Symphony. This so was recorded in 1967. It sounds wonderful in this Deutsche Grammophon Originals release. Uh, you also get the Lieder eines fahrenden Gesellen with Dieter Fischer Diskau. Those are great too. But uh, this is just, a, a, he did a full uh, cycle of these with the Bavarian Radio Symphony, which is a very good cycle uh, for Mahler. Um, but this one is really a standout. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, dramatic, uh, it's, it's got great energy, great power, uh, it sounds great, so you can't go wrong with that one. Uh, a, another version of the first I recommend, however, is with someone who was very known for his Mahler, and that is Leonard Bernstein. This is his digital uh, recording with the Concertgebouw from 1987. Uh, he did two cycles, and I would say he did two cycles. There, there, the second cycle had to be, there were a couple that had to be, I think maybe just one recording, maybe it was the eighth, I think that had to be collected into the cycle because he died before it could be completed. But the cycle exists in Deutsche Grammophon. Uh, there's also an earlier complete cycle on Sony with the New York Philharmonic. 
I tend to prefer the second one. I think the second one is where Bernstein's interpretations matured, uh, and he kind of lets loose a little bit more with the emotions. Uh, the the not, but the New York cycle is also very good. Uh, it's maybe a little bit more sharp uh, and concentrated. Uh, but this first uh, with the Concertgebouw is one where, say, compared to say Kubelik, for example, Bernstein lets the emotions hang out a little bit more. It's it's a uh, some might say it's maybe even a little bit over the top, but in Mahler that can sometimes be you know a, a, a good thing. Is it sometimes fits uh, with the the emotions of uh, uh, Mahler symphonies. So this is great. It's also a wonderful uh, sounding recording as well. I also want to recommend a couple of historic versions of the Mahler first. The first one is from a conductor we have not yet discussed, Dmitri Metropolis, Greek conductor who uh, was a very passionate, very exciting conductor. Uh, this one's with the uh, Minneapolis Symphony from 1940. And so it's got limited sound quality, but it's just very intense, very exciting. Uh, definitely one you want to hear for the Mahler first. However, uh, if I was going to have only one Mahler first, uh, uh, it would be this one. Bruno Walter, 1939, the NBC Symphony Orchestra, Toscanini's Orchestra. This was shortly after Bruno Walter, uh, who was Jewish, escaped Europe uh, you know, during the Nazi occupation of uh, Austria. And uh, this is a live concert, and it is just electric from beginning to end. Uh, the the uh, sound quality is rather dry, as you would get with uh, the NBC Symphony. Uh, I don't know if this was recorded in that same studio, Studio 6H, or, or no, what was it? It was a live concert, right? So, yeah, concert from April 8th, 1939. So it, it wasn't in that horrendous studio, but it still sounds somewhat on the dry sound, but it is just exciting as hell, and um, it's, it's actually, it sounds pretty good, and you can hear it pretty clearly. Um, you won't want to miss this one if you love the Mahler first. All right, now let's talk about the second, one of, one of Mahler's most popular symphonies, uh, just an epic, it, it's almost, it's, it's, I was going to say almost reminds me of the Beethoven Ninth, but there's an obvious reason for that. That's because it has a chorus <laughs> showing up at the end, just like the Beethoven Ninth does. Uh, but it, it's just a real epic symphony. And uh, the one for this one, and, and it's one of those that engages these enormous, you know, large masses. Uh, the first recording I recommend for this one is sort of a, a sonic spectacular, you might say. Zubin Mehta, the Vienna Philharmonic, 1975. Wonderful sounding deca recording. You get all the drama here. Uh, that that ending is just scintillating with the, cor the choral finish here. Uh, so this is one that I recommend first. However, there are Many more that you'll want to check out for the Second Symphony, beginning with Klemperer. And for Klemperer, there are three versions that are all worth <laughs> investigating. Uh, I'll start with the studio one from 1962 with the Philharmonia. And as you would expect with Klemperer, the power builds more patiently, more slowly. Uh, and, and you might be frustrated with that in this piece especially where, where you kind of want the fireworks uh, but, but it definitely has uh, a, a grit and uh, a relentlessness to it that you associate with Klemper and there's a reason that he was known for this symphony and he was known for his Mahler in, in general um, however this performance is a live performance with the Bavarian Radio Symphony from 1965, which I think is even better than the studio performance and, and sounds pretty good. You almost can't even tell that it's a live recording. Um, it, there's just an extra excitement to this one that I think outshines the, the studio recording, great as that one is. And finally, I will mention this room from 1951. This is with the Concertgebouw Orchestra and uh, the, the sound is limited. It's not terrible, but it's, it's definitely limited. But here you do see Klemper uh, a little bit more, you know, he's, he's, he's a little more quick and incisive. Uh, I still think this one's overall, uh, for the overall dramatic impact is, is, is better. Um, but this one definitely is no sleeper. Um, 
it's it's just real exciting, real powerful, and uh, one you should hear if you love the Second Symphony. All right, so that's Klemperer. Now let's talk about another famous version of the Mahler Second, Sir Simon Rattle with the City of Birmingham uh, Symphony Orchestra. Uh, he did, I think it was a complete cycle he did in Birmingham. I know, I know there's, I know he did several. I don't know if he did all of them. But uh, this one is, is without a doubt the, the most famous one. And Rattle, his, his version of the, of the second uh, is one that's more, I would also say that it's, it's more patient. Uh, if, if you think of Baller and especially the second as an example of, of sort of bombast <laughs> uh, rattle might be one that you like because he takes a more um, introspective uh, uh, interpretation but still powerful in its own way and it's got wonderful sound uh, being a digital recording as well so it's definitely one that you're want, gonna want to consider however if I'm gonna talk about one performance that for me in the Mahler second uh, really brings it home the strongest uh, despite not having the best uh, sound quality, it's this live recording from Barbaroli. This is with the Stuttgart Radio Symphony Orchestra, uh, recorded live, did I already say the year? 1970 is the year. Um, it's a little bit noisy, uh, so it doesn't have the best sound quality, but it's, it's fairly present, fairly full. And Barbaroli just, <laughs> he just brings home all the emotions in this work. It's a really draining experience and one that overall is, is my Mahler second of choice. However, I've got a couple of more vintage versions. The first one is from 1958. This one is from Hermann Scherchen uh, with the Vienna State Opera Orchestra. This was recorded in 1958. Scherchen uh, was a, uh, a, a really unique conductor. Uh, he, he, was, he was definitely kind of an, an iconoclast. Uh, he could sometimes conduct things uh, in just a really fast tempos that you didn't hear from others. Uh, he was uh, a revolutionary when it came to performances of Bach, uh, for example. Also did a, a great set of Haydn symphonies. Uh, and he was, he was real exciting. And so this Mahler second is uh, one that you're going to want to seek out for for the excitement that he brought to it. Um, it's not the best recorded, uh, of course, uh, being from 1958. Uh, to be honest, I can't remember if it's a live or a studio recording, but in any case, um, it's, you know, you can hear it clearly, but you know, it's not gonna be like, you know, say the rattle or the, or the meta, uh, but it's, it's very exciting and worth seeking out. And let's not forget Bruno Walter. Now this is a live recording in Carnegie Hall from 1957 with the New York Philharmonic. And uh, Walter uh, was an, another Mahler specialist uh, like Klemperer. Uh, and uh, he did a recording with, I can't remember if it's the Columbia Symphony or the New York Philharmonic, uh, one of the two in studio that's been released on Sony. But it's this one that I think shows Walter at his best, at his most inspired. Uh, he had this spiritual quality that shone through in his Mahler that, again, helps with, you know, if, if you think of if Mahler's music, especially this symphony, as being sort of loud and bombastic, then this, this is one that might make you a convert. Um, and again, I, even though the sound quality is not great, it's, it's a live, you know, 50s recording, it's, it's one that I really think shows Walter at his best. Otherwise, you might also try the, uh, the studio recording uh, on Sony. It's definitely a, a, a popular version with many. All right, so that's the second. Now let's talk about the Mahler third. The Mahler third is long. <laughs> I don't. I can't remember if it's his longest. I think it might be his longest symphony. And, and uh, I'll tell an anecdote. I I knew a, a disc jockey uh, who once said that he uh, when he would want to take a break and just go out of the studio, maybe get some coffee or lunch or something, he would put on the Mahler third because he knew that he would have time to leave and come back. Um, so it's really long. It's a little bit more mercurial, um, but it's, it's a beautiful work. And that fi the final adagio to the piece is, is really something. Uh, it's it's uh, almost kind of transcendent. Uh, 
in, in, in the way it, it, it comes to its conclusion. Um, the the uh, top choice uh, that I recommend for this one is one that a lot of others have recommended as well. And it's another Mahler specialist. I, I put him up there with Barbara Rowley among Mahler conductors, and that's Yasha Ornstein. This is with the London Symphony. It's recorded in 1970. Uh, pretty good sounding recording. Uh, it's not maybe as full as the best, like say, Decca or Deutsche Grammophon recordings, but it, it sounds pretty good. And Ornstein, uh, like I've said before with his Brahms first, he was a conductor who was very patient. Um, he didn't just like thrill you right at the, at, at, out the gate, but he, he built things slowly and had these you know, just wonderful slow building climaxes. And his final adagio is just, just the way it develops is just masterful. So this is a great recording of the third, as is this one from Barbaroli. Uh, unfortunately, he did not record it in the studio, but he did do a live version, which this is with the Halle Orchestra. This was recorded in 1969. And it does have a little bit more of that sort of extrovert quality uh, compared to, say, the Hornst, uh, Orenstein. Uh, so that's also a Mahler third you're going to want to check out. However, if I was to choose one Mahler third without considering sound quality, it would be this one, F. Charles Adler. Now, you might be asking, who? <laughs> Even seasoned classical music enthusiasts have, have rarely heard of this conductor. He, he recorded very little. Uh, first of all, let me mention about Adler. Um, he actually knew Mahler. He was, in fact, Mahler's concertmaster for the premiere of the Eighth Symphony. So he's got his Mahler credentials, and that's part of the reason why we have a recording of him conducting Mahler, because they wanted to get it on tape. And this is with the uh, Vienna Concertverein, recorded in 1952. And Adler conducts a Mahler third that, to me, communicates the spirit of the work like, like none other, especially in that, uh, that final movement. Uh, it, it just has a way of, of proceeding that sounds inevitable, and this feeling of arrival you have at the very end is, to me, unmatched. So this is definitely a recording to seek out. It sounds pretty good for 1952. It's, it's going to be a little limited uh, compared to the best sounding recordings, but definitely worth seeking out. All right, now let's talk about the fourth. The fourth is, along with the first, uh, one of Mahler's uh, more compact symphonies. Uh, it's somewhat more accessible, too. Uh, it's a little bit sunnier. It's got this exquisitely beautiful uh, final movement with the uh, uh, soprano soloist uh, that, that ends in this, this peaceful quietness. It's, it's just gorgeous. Uh, for this one, my top choice is, uh, again, Yasha Ornstein, this time with the London Philharmonic uh, Orchestra. Uh, this, again, was recorded in 1970. Um, the soprano soloist is Marilyn Horn, and it's a little bit of a... So, somewhat slower interpretation uh, than others, but I think it really works. Uh, it, it brings home that, that peaceful quality. It, it's, it's just got this, um, this great uh, uh, feeling of, of uh, peacefulness to it, uh, that, that beautiful middle movement and then the final movement with, with uh, Marilyn Horn singing beautifully. The recording is excellent. <clears throat> Another really good version, but this is a live recording. This is from Barbaroli. Heather Harper is the soprano soloist. This is from 1967 with the BBC Symphony Orchestra. And this features all of Barbaroli's great skill with Mahler, his, his, his loving attention uh, and, and phrasing. Uh, and so this is a, another just beautiful recording as well. Uh, for something maybe a little bit more, uh, you might say, non-interventionist, more straightforward, you might say, uh, we have this one from Paul Kletsky. This is with the Philharmonia. <clears throat> Amy Luce is the soprano soloist. It, it actually comes coupled with a really good Das Lied von der Erde, a, a male version, an all-male version with Mary Dickey and Dietrich Fischer Dieskau. Uh, so that's worth seeking out. But the main thing I'm, I'm bringing your, to your attention here is the fourth. Uh, very well recorded, very well played, uh, a, a dependable, you know, central recommendation, as, as they say. Uh, now for a couple of historical versions. First, I want to mention 
Bruno Walter. Oh, this is just a beautiful uh, recording. <clears throat> it's unfortunately, it's a live recording, uh, 1955, so it's, it doesn't have the best sound. Uh, Hilda Guden is the uh, soprano soloist, and she sings, sings wonderfully. Uh, but mainly, it's it's the way he he conducts this. With a, he, he he, there's actually a lot of fourths out there from Bruno Walter. Uh, there also are a couple with uh, Ermgard Siefried, uh, the the incredible uh, soprano. Uh, I think they're both from like 1950. One with the Vienna Philharmonic, one with the New York Philharmonic. Those are really good. Uh, but I I found this one to be especially uh, great. Uh, Walter's humanity, his spirituality, it, it all comes comes forth in this uh, the the wonderful uh, third movement adagio. Uh, so th this is. As a historical version, despite despite the sound quality, this is this is really worth seeking out. Also, because it's not often you get to hear Walter with the Vienna Philharmonic, uh, that's a great combination in Mahler. They, they play just beautifully. Um, however, if you want to get a historic version of the fourth, you have to get Mangelberg, Willem Mangelberg, uh, the almost the entire first half of the century. He was the conductor of the Concertgebouw. And he even invited Mahler himself to come to Amsterdam and conduct the fourth. So <laughs> to say that he knew Mahler is, is an understatement. Um, Mengelberg, compared to what we are used to now, Mengelberg was the quintessential romantic conductor. Uh, he took a lot of liberty with, uh, with the things he conducted, sometimes not always convincingly so, at least according you know, to, to modern taste. Uh, and, and definitely in this fourth, uh, he, he does that. Uh, the tempo fluctuates quite a bit, but it works really well. Uh, the soprano soloist is Joe Vincent. Uh, the sound quality is not great, but not terrible for, for 1939. Um, it's, it, it's definitely one that you're going to want to, you're going to want to seek out. Uh, it, it, just, just great Mahler, very emotional, uh, dramatic, uh, beautiful. All right. That is the fourth. <clears throat> now let's talk about the Mahler fifth. The Mahler fifth is uh, just a real dramatic symphony. Uh, it's got, of course, the most famous movement that Mahler composed, uh, the Adagietto. Uh, many classical fans know this. It's just this gorgeous, gorgeous uh, movement, uh, mainly mainly for strings uh, with, with the harp featured as well. Uh, my top recommendation for the fifth is the classic Barbaroli, which again is also available in this great box set. This is with the new Philharmonia, uh, recorded in 1969. It's got great sound. The Philharmonia sounds great. And uh, Barbaroli's interpretation, it's, it's just got all the qualities that he brings to Mahler. Of, of very emotional, but also balanced and uh, attention to everything in terms of what the character is. Uh, the, the Adagietto is just gorgeous. And then it, the finale is a little controversial for being a little bit held back on the slow side, but I think it works. I mean, it's a long movement and and the end of it, uh, to me, brings back br brings the, the emotions uh, out the way it's, it's supposed to. However, you can also get a, this is a somewhat newer recording. This is from Frank Shipway. This is from 1996. Not a very well-known conductor, but really good one. This is with the Royal Philharmonic. Um, you do get a little bit more of, the, of the, uh, the, the faster tempo in that final movement, but you even get, a, a on the other hand, uh, an adagietto that's really long uh, compared to most versions, and that really works as well. This is a great, great Mahler fifth. Um, so I, I highly recommend this one, and it's and it's well played, really exciting. Uh, also, we have oh, can't leave out Bernstein. Uh, Bernstein, of course, always brought home the emotion, and and that's what you get here. It it just all hangs out. This is with the Vienna Philharmonic, recorded in 1987. Sounds fantastic, and you cannot mention Bernstein and the Mahler fifth without mentioning that. He is buried with the Mahler fifth with the score open to the Adagio, uh, Adagietto on his heart. Uh, obviously a piece that he was identified with and, and one that you have to hear if, if you love the Mahler fifth. Um, now one that is maybe kind of not quite the same as, as Bernstein, more that more the emotions are kind of more held in check, is this one, Vaclav Nyman, 
uh, Vaclav Neumann, sorry, uh, with the Leipzig Gewandhaus. This was recorded in 1966, I believe, uh, on Philips, and it sounds really good. Of course, the concert goodbye, you can never go wrong with them for a beautiful, beautiful tone. And, and, and yeah, th this is a recording where I, I, it's maybe a little bit on the comparatively the reserved side, but I, I think it works really well. Uh, it, everything is just sounds beautiful, just well paced, and it's it's a really strong uh, proverbial sleeper version. Um, and then finally, oh, this one is is just gorgeous. This is from Rudolf Schwartz, not a very familiar name either. This is with the London Symphony, recorded in 1958, and this is one of those Everest recordings. Uh, another one, kind of like the Mercury Living Presence recordings from the time same time period. They're just wonderful. Very, very full, very present, very detailed. Uh, just, just they, don't, they just don't make them like that anymore. Uh, and the interpretation is just great. It's very dramatic. It's a little bit on the dark side. Uh, the Adagietto is actually a little bit on the quick side compared to what we're, we're used to, which some historians say is actually the way Mahler preferred it. So take that for what it's worth. But in any case, this is one of the great Mahler fifth recordings. All right, so that's the Mahler 5th. Now let's talk about the Mahler 6th. Oh boy, this is, now we're getting into some, some the, the, I mentioned you know that Mahler can be some, somewhat on the, the heavy, depressing side. This is an example of, of that. This, is, this one is, is pretty dark. It's it pretty, pretty, uh, pretty dramatic. And I, I have to recommend uh, as, a, as a top recommendation for this one, like the fifth, it's considered a classic, and that is Barbaroli. Oh, did I have it up? Okay, yeah, <laughs> it's right side up. Barbaroli with the new Philharmonia. And if I can get it out again, it comes in the box set, of course. Uh, this was recorded in 1967. And, oh my God, this, this version is just... It, I remember the first time I heard this. It's it's a little controversial actually because the the tempo in the first movement is on the slow side, but you're you're being pounded just real slowly and it's just boom 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 and and to me it 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 has a really strong effect. Uh, it, the recording quality is fantastic. Um, it's it's just overwhelming to me this this version. I mean, a, a lot of that goes, of course, credit to Mahler. <laughs> it's just, it's just an incredible symphony. Um, incidentally, Barbaroli did a concert version of this um, that was released on Testament. I think a few days before this recording was made, which, interestingly enough, the tempo of the first movement is more fast, you know, more conventionally quick. Uh, it just goes to show that often with the, the greatest artist, they could change their mind day to day. You know, it, it, they, they weren't always settled on, on how to do things. But this, this definitely works. However, if you do want to hear a more conventional, more quick first movement, there is an excellent version also from Bernstein. This is with the Vienna Philharmonic recorded in 1988. Also very dramatic, also just overwhelming in its, in, its, in its power. That final movement just really, you know, really packs a punch. So this is great, and it's also wonderfully recorded. Uh, incidentally, this is one where, okay, so the middle movements, this little controversial topic, you know, among Mahlerites, is that whether he wanted the, the Andante to be second and the Scherzo to be third, or, you know, the slow and then the fast movement, or he wanted it flipped. So in the in the Barbaroli commercial uh, recording, you do get the Andante and then the Scherzo, and then the Bernstein recording, you get it flipped. It doesn't really matter to me. I mean, you could always listen to them in that order if you want. Um, personally, I prefer having the Andante second because it feels to me like when I hear the beginning of the Scherzo, I feel like, well, didn't I just hear that with the first movement? That's my own personal, you know, feeling is that the Andante is, is a perfect kind of respite from from the the drama and excitement of the first movement but others see it differently so if you want to make comments about that feel free in any case this is also a great recording i'm only going to mention one other one for the six and that is a live recording from 1955 with uh another conductor of the concertgebouw named edward van Bainham. uh 
the recording quality is you know not that great uh but you know it's it's listenable uh but it's just a really intense performance really gripping uh so if you if you love the Mahler 6 uh, i recommend that you check out this one as well all right so we're only going to do one more Mahler symphony and this one is for me the Mahler masterpiece up there with with the the Beethoven ninth and the the Bruckner eighth among masterpieces um the ninth symphony is is just incredible um there's a movie i think it's called birdman with michael keaton that features the beginning of this symphony uh so if you know that movie you you may know and you know you, you may already unknowingly like this symphony or maybe you've you've checked it out based on that but it's 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 just gorgeous and dramatic and and deep and and the uh the final movement uh particularly um it the whole thing is, is, is just wonderful um so my first recommendation for this is if i can find it here um well no surprise barbaroli again again in the box set also available as a single cd uh now this one actually is recorded with the berlin philharmonic not one that you associate with Bar barbaroli very often um it was recorded in 1964. Sounds very good. Uh, this is actually a Japanese remastering, which I think has actually improved the sound, which you should also get with this Warner box as well, because this actually came out after this. So that should not be a problem, the sound quality. Um, Barbaroli just, you know, he was a consummate interpreter of Mahler, knew exactly uh, how, how to pace things, how to milk the emotions in just the right way. And this, this Mahler ninth is no exception. Um, however, I do want to bring your attention to a live recording, which is even, in my opinion, uh, a more emotional experience uh, than that studio recording, and that's this one. This is the Turin Radio Italian Symphony Orchestra, uh, recorded live in 1960. Um, it's a little bit noisy. There's some ill-timed coughs and so on, uh, but it's it's a pretty you know pretty clear present recording nonetheless. The the playing is maybe a little bit scrappy, but oh boy, as a Mahler ninth, um, this to me is just an incredible experience. Uh, maybe you know not the recording to live with as your only recording, but definitely one to hear if you love the Mahler ninth. <coughs> However, with a piece as great as this one you're going to want to at least hear other versions and there may not be a more celebrated famous version than this one carry in with the berlin philharmonic recorded live in 1982 now carry ann's mahler can be a little bit controversial for some uh Car -Ann was known for being glitzy he loved um you know, glean and the, and, the, and the sound quality. He was considered sometimes superficial. You might say, I don't agree with that. Uh, I wouldn't have been recommending him for all these different recordings if I felt that way. Uh, but the point is that the combination of Carrion and Mahler can sometimes be a little anachronistic for some people uh, because Mahler was, you know, the opposite of that. He, he was, you know, uh, introspective, uh, you know, de depressing in many ways. Um, so I, I, a lot of people, this recording as celebrated as it is can be somewhat controversial in, in some ways, um, but I, I think that it, this is a fantastic version of this symphony. Uh, it's it's Carrion at his most inspired, most dramatic. The Berlin Philharmonic sounds amazing. I mean, that's why this is such a celebrated recording. And he actually did it did do it in studio with them in 1980, and that's a, that's a good recording. But it, here, you really do do hear the difference in the emotions, um, just being that much more palpable, uh, and the commitment. Yes, it sounds beautiful. Just because it sounds beautiful doesn't mean that it's superficial or not as emotional or dramatic. I, I, I think it still is one of the best baller nights you can get. Boy, in the in the final movement, when there's that moment where the strings are just by themselves, just uh, uh, like that, you can hear them just digging in. Uh, it's just really a fantastic moment. So you're going to want to hear this one. Um, however... We do have one that's more recent, also with the Berlin Philharmonic, and this is with Sir Simon Rattle. This is recorded in 2007, and 
I almost want to say as an introduction to the Mahler Ninth, this may want to be the one that you hear first because uh, it, it just sounds so so good. And Rattle, as I mentioned uh, with his second, uh, he he really loved delving into these uh, in, into the introspection of Mahler's music, uh, and so he he never sounded superficial. Um, there may be some you know more dramatic versions around, but Rattle has a way of of pacing the symphony that everything sounds just right and with the detail and the sound quality um, it all really comes through so this is Mahler Ninth. I mean it's such a great symphony there, there are a lot of great recordings I think this definitely belongs among them as does Klemperer with the uh, new Philharmonia uh, this was recorded in 1967 and with Klemperer um, you get a, a just a really gripping, dramatic performance. Of, of course, you know, what do you expect with Klemper? He always has that sort of grounded gravitas about him um, that compels you to keep listening. And so that almost has its, there's almost a built-in um, feeling of, of, of uh, seriousness that you get whenever you hear Klemper uh, conducting. And so with this symphony, you, you get that. And the orchestra is really inspired in this recording as well. It, it's really one of the great Mahler nights. Um, as is this recording from the other side of the Iron Curtain from the Moscow Philharmonic. Uh, this is with Kirill Kondrashin. It was recorded in 1964. And the thing that really sets this apart is just the go for broke emotions of, of this performance. It, they, they really milk it. Uh, it's really exciting. Uh, if you love the Mahler Ninth already, this may not be your you know, first choice, but if you love the Mahler Ninth already and you want to hear it done in a way that, that uh, is, is just to the limits emotionally, this is a really strong one. Um, as is this one. From the Czech Philharmonic and Carol Anschel. Uh, this was recorded in 1966 and it sounds really good in the super fond sound. Um, Anschel's version is not as overtly dramatic as Kondrashin, but uh, it's, it's beautifully played, uh, beautifully paced. Uh, it's got this kind of starkness to it. Uh, it in other words, it's, it's not like maybe as overtly dramatic as some but the it's got this this quality to it that um, ma that makes the drama come forth in a, in a different way if that if that makes sense it it <clears throat> it's just um, you know a really gorgeous gorgeous version of the Mahler that you're also going to want to want to check out. However, I have one more choice. This is the historic choice, and if the Carrie Ann version is not the most famous version of the Mahler Ninth, and this one maybe. This is from 1938. Bruno Walter with the Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, many people know the story that this was right before he fled, before the, the Nazi uh, takeover of Austria. Um, this is just absolutely one of the most ten in intense performances of the Mahler Ninth. Uh, you, you can you can just feel it. You can feel it in the orchestra now. Now you know. I understand that some people don't like the idea of of uh, projecting the historic circumstances onto what you hear. You know, it could be just something they had for lunch that day, right? <laughs> but uh, you know, more than likely than not, there, there was something going on in in that in that uh, concert hall, given given what was what was in the process of happening no, regardless uh, it's it, the the emotion is just palpable you hear it uh, there's just this incredible intensity and inspiration and the combination of that with a piece like this it's just something you're going to want to hear uh, to me the only thing that's controversial about this recording is is more Walter's interpretation which is also true of his later recording um, he kind of cuts the coda, the, the, the ending of the finale, a little bit short, um, especially to someone, compared to someone like, say, Barbaroli, uh, to where I, I feel like the full impact of it is not felt like it could be. It, it's just me. I, I know others have commented on that as well. Um, but it, it, 
that's not to take away from the fact that this is still one of the greatest recordings of the Mala Ninth. Uh, the sound is actually not bad for 1938. Um, you, you can hear everything. Um, there is a cleaner recording of, uh, a transfer of it than this one. This is the EMI. There is a one by uh, Dutton. Dutton Laboratories, if you ever see historical recordings pre-mastered by Dutton, by the way, they tend to be first class, very cleaned up, uh, almost amazing what they do. I will say though, the one drawback to 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 that is you you sometimes lose the fullness of the sound, and in this case, I actually prefer the EMI. I think it has, I think I'm getting more of the integrity of the of what was actually going on in the, in the record in, in the performance when I when I listen to this one. My minor quibble, I you know I, I the Dutton is still very fine, especially if you want to hear you know less static and noise. All right, so that is Mahler. Whew. Now let's move on to something, uh, as they say in Monty Python, and now for something completely different. Felix Mendelssohn, a uh, romantic composer, uh, very colorful, wonderful melodies, uh, and that's what you get with uh, the third symphony, the Scottish symphony, the first one I'm going to talk about. Uh, and the recording that I have to recommend for that one is Peter Mogg. This is with the London Symphony. This was recorded in 1960, and Mog was a really, really gifted conductor uh, in terms of uh, pacing. Uh, there was a, this spontaneous feel to the, what he conducted, kind of like what you get with Furtwängler, who actually was his his mentor. Um, that almost like it's it's being made up on the spot, uh, and he just had this really eloquent way and very affectionate way of phrasing. And, and you get that here, um, just really well done, beautifully played, beautifully recorded. This is a real revered Mendelssohn recording. It, it also comes with uh, the He Brides Overture and the Midsummer Night's Dream Overture, uh, two, two of uh, Mendelssohn's most famous works. So this one is strongly recommended. Also, Claudio Abbado, uh, who uh, recorded this version in 1967 with the uh, also with the London Symphony, uh, along now one thing about this one is you get this one coupled with uh, his fourth symphony, the Italian Symphony. So if you fancy that coupling, you might want this. Uh, Abato did re-record these works later uh, for Deutsche Grammophon, also with the London Symphony in the uh, the uh, 1980s. Uh, that was part of a complete cycle, so you might want that one if you want all five symphonies. Uh, but he did have a little bit more vigor. Uh, I'd say a little bit more grit in this early recording. Not that there's anything you know bad about the later one. Those those are certainly among the among the most recommendable versions as well. But uh, I would say for Abato, uh, this one is really if you want just the third and the fourth, this is the one to get. Uh, really just uh, wonderfully alert, uh, wonderfully sung, uh, very spirited performances. Uh, now for the fourth symphony, if you want that one by itself. Uh, I recommend this one. Now, this is with uh, Giuseppe Sinopoli with the Philharmonia, a digital recording from 1983. Sounds great. Uh, the Italian Symphony is Mendelssohn's uh, most popular symphonic work. Uh, it's got wonderful melodies, and this recording is just uh, really great. It, it's a, a it's very elegant, very charming, very spirited, uh, lots of great energy. Uh, so that's a top choice, as is the Abado that I just mentioned. The Abado again. Here's this one. Um, this one is really the. It, I would say that there's not much to choose between this one and the Sinopoli, to be honest. Um, they're both very charming, very elegant. Uh, you know, great, great energy and spirit. Uh, for something a little bit different, we have this one from Charles Munch and the Boston Symphony. Uh, with the excellent sounding recording again the, these vintage recordings this is rca living stereo from 1958 and munchen's version has a little bit more heft to it a little more more powerful it's a little bit slower but munch was always a very good uh, dramatic conductor and uh if you want a little bit more a little bit more power and and heft to uh to uh, your recording of the italian symphony this is an excellent choice uh, also we have george Zell and the Cleveland Orchestra. This is from 1962. Uh, this one, you know, you could always count on Zell and Cleveland for great energy. 
and, and spirit, and you certainly get that here. And of course, you also get the immaculate detail, immaculate clarity. Um, so that is an excellent version. It's it's you know a little bit on the faster side compared to Munch, as you, as you might expect. All right, so that is Mendelssohn. Now we have come to Mozart, Wolfgang, Amadeus, Mozart, who of course, like Joseph Haydn, uh, was a classical uh, era composer. Uh, this is before Beethoven's Eroica, so the symphonies were more, more compact. Uh, and with Mozart, uh, definitely, you know, his final two symphonies, those are the ones that you come to first in terms of the, you know, among the pantheon of the greatest symphonies composed. Uh, but you also often see the final six that begin with the Hafner Symphony, which is number 35. You see those often in complete sets, uh, as well as the final four, which is what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to start with the 38th Symphony, the Prague Symphony, which is this really beautiful symphony, just, you know, gorgeous harmonies. And uh, the perfect conductor for that one is one we just discussed. Peter Mogg again, uh, just a gorgeous recording of this symphony. He, he, he just makes me love this. Um, it makes me want to say that this is my favorite of all the Mozart symphonies. It's just a very uh, kind of soulful uh, way of, of conducting it and uh, just really beautiful, great recording quality. Uh, this, this comes from uh, like somewhere around 19, and I think it's 1959, uh, Decca, uh, excellent quality. So definitely one you want to hear for the 38th. As is a great Mozart conductor, fellow composer, Benjamin Britten, the great British composer. This is with the English Chamber Orchestra. This was recorded in 1970. And uh, Britten was great with Mozart. He, he was elegant. He brought the charm. But then there was also this warmth. Uh, to the sound. So that's an excellent version of 38th. If you want something a little different, however, there is Macaris. This is a set of just the final four symphonies with the Scottish Chamber Orchestra recorded in 2007. I think all four of these recordings were from 2007. And this is just really uh, very different. It's, it's, it tends to be fast. Um, Particularly the slower movements, adagios and adantes, that's where you maybe, maybe notice it more. Um, he definitely never, you know, sits back. Um, but boy, are these exciting. Um, the recording is excellent. The playing is excellent. Uh, if you want more edge of your seat Mozart, this, this, is, this is the one to go for. So there's Macaris. Going back to a little bit more the old school, sort of the opposite, is Klemperer. Now, Klemperer was an excellent Mozart conductor, and uh, I don't, of course, generally recommend you know complete sets. But if you're going to get a set of Mozart uh, symphonies, I would say Klemperer is a really, really good one. Um, you might think that he's going to be heavy and ponderous in Mozart, and sure, he tended to be a little bit slower in his tempos, but he's not heavy. Uh, it's it's a, he, he conducted in a very natural way. He, he was not an idiosyncratic conductor. Uh, he wasn't one that was trying to force his will. He, he pretty much started and then he just proceeded forward. Uh, and th that naturalness really works well in Mozart. Um, now this 38th, uh, this comes from uh, 1956. It's actually a mono recording. Uh, he did a later one in stereo, but this one has more energy and uh, it's a really powerful recording. Uh, one really good thing about the, the set that I'm discussing uh, as the, you know, the, so it's not a complete set of all the Mozart symphonies, but most of the ones starting with, like, say, 25 and then 29 and going forward. Uh, one really great thing about that set is they include both versions, like his 40th symphony, both the, the early one and the later one. The, both the mono 41st and the later one. So that's great. So you can listen to both versions. Uh, in most cases, the early one, earlier ones are the ones to get, even though they, the sound is a little bit more limited. And, and that's the case here. Um, this, of course, does come also. This is issued by Testament. This is a single version with the 38th and 39th. All right, so that's the 38th. Now let's discuss. Uh, oh, wait, actually, I have one more. Ah. 
This is the historic choice. I mean, it, I mean, that one's kind of historic, but this one's really historic. This is from the late 30s. This is Sir Thomas Beecham. Uh, this is with the London Philharmonic. Uh, he did, let's see, 29, 31, 34, and then I believe all, yeah, then the, and then the final six. And these are, you, you just have to hear them if you love Mozart. Uh, the tempos tend to be a little bit on the slower side, but with, with Beecham, you know, he's always rhythmically sprung, elegant. He's also dramatic and powerful. And yes, these are going to be limited sounding qualities. They were recording it, recorded in studio, so they sound pretty good for their time. But, you know, 1930s, it's, it's, going, to be, it's going to be limited. But this is a really great, really great 38th. Okay, now the 39th. We're getting into a symphony that shows a little bit more uh, almost Beethovenian power, I would say, with Mozart's writing. Uh, and then this one has this finale that's just really kind of almost like a, a romp. It's just, uh, you know, like um, almost, you know, kind of like, kind of dance-like. Uh, so that's a lot of fun. Um, here's a set of Mozart symphonies that I might recommend uh, um, as well as the Klemperer, if you want, uh, like say the you know the final six together, that's Carl Bame with the Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, with Bame, you you know you're going to get a wonderful sound from the Vienna Philharmonic, uh, a really natural interpretation, uh, great sound. Um, his Mozart did tend to be it could be a little bit on the pedestrian side in terms of tempo. Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, as the you know, reason why I, I don't like complete sets, but you know, this is the only way you can get this, is um, they tend to be variable. However, this 39th is great. They were uh, uh, alive and vibrant, powerful, everything, you know, coming together for a really great 39th. Um, however, I would also recommend for the 39th, George Zell and the Cleveland Orchestra. Uh, this is, he, now he did all the, the, the late Mozart symphonies as well. And that, that is also a prime recommendation. But I think these two in particular are show Zell at his strongest. Uh, that final movement uh, is, is wonderful in Zell's hand. Just a lot of energy uh, and uh, just real fun. All right, so that is Zell. We also have, of course, going back to Macaris. That final movement is amazing in Macaris's hand. Really clear, um, just you know, you know, exciting. Um, the slow movement is, is going to be a little bit faster, but you know, it, it's it's just an interpretive choice on his part. Um, so you take it or leave it. But these, you know, they just demand to be heard. The, these performances. Uh, the only one that to me is a little bit, you know, it 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 kind of takes away from the. Uh, maybe the drama and emotion is, is the 40th, which I'll get to, where I think the quality of always kind of pushing forward doesn't, you know, maybe a little bit too much. But the 39th is, is really wonderful. Also, we have, again, the Beecham. Uh, this one uh, with the London Philharmonic, uh, like the, the one in, uh, the, like the 38th, it was recorded in 1940. Uh, and again, you get the drama, power, elegance, charm, and poor sound quality, but hey. Um, however, if you want poor sound quality, we also have one from 1934. Now this is Bruno Walter, who was excellent at Mozart. And the reason I choose this one for the 39th is uh, especially that final movement. Um, I mean, they that one is just a clinic in, in pacing and excitement. Uh, and uh, it, this is one that you you should check out. Uh, it has, uh, I think, most of the. I think this particular set has most of the final symphonies. Uh, there's also the Requiem in here. Um, obviously, the sound is very limited, and in a lot of these cases, you're going to want to hear Walter's later recordings. Uh, but definitely, uh, if if you uh, are admirer of Bruno Walter, you want to hear some of his early Mozart as well. He just had a fire back in those days that you you didn't hear quite as much. Uh, in his stereo recordings. All right, so that is the 39th. Now we come to the final two, uh, his most popular, and uh, maybe my favorite is the 40th. Uh, it, Mozart, of course, was a great melodist, and 
the fortieth starts with that iconic ba ba bum ba ba bum ba ba bum ba 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 bum ba ba bum ba ba bum you know just gorgeous. And my recording of choice for both these two symphonies is Bernstein with the Vienna Philharmonic. You can also get Bernstein in a uh, three CD box set, which includes most of the later symphonies started with 25. And again, they're going to be variable, but uh, considering he, he pretty much nails the, the last two, uh, that's definitely one to, to look at. Uh, the, the 40th, uh, it's a little on the slow side in that first movement, but there's uh, this el elegiac quality to it. It's a little, it's a little bit, you know, uh, you know, kind of contemplative, you might say, that, that first movement, and which, which fits. Uh, it, you know, the, this was one of his more maybe slightly dark symphonies, you know, dark for Mozart at least. And Bernstein really brings that home. And he's, he also conducts with this fabulous energy and being a composer himself, he understands structure and so on, and the playing is beautiful and the recording is great. It's from 1984. So that's a real winner. As is Klemperer. This is his 1956 recording. Uh, you can also get it as part of that, uh, of that set. It also is a little bit slower in the first movement, but again, it has this naturalness. Oh, this recording is just so beautiful. Uh, the Philharmonia, they play beautifully. Um, this is a great 40th. Uh, if you want to hear something with a little bit more uh, fire in that first movement, then I would say try Britain. Britain does uh, a quicker first movement uh, uh, that is just more vibrant and um, it's also excellent. Um, he takes the slow movement, the, I'm not a big guy on repeats, but he takes the repeat so it makes it longer, but it works, he, he sells it. So this is a fabulous version as well. Um, if you wanna hear quick, of course you can hear Macaris. I already mentioned that one. Um, again, we have Beecham. Uh, he's going to be also a little bit slow in that first movement, but very elegant, very charming. However, if I want to hear an interpretation, and I'm not as big on sound quality for number 40, then the version I go back to is Fort Wengler. This is the live recording that I mentioned earlier, is the Brahms Fourth. A couple with the Brahms Fourth and Wiesbaden with the Berlin Philharmonic. Uh, this one, he just nails it. Uh, it is fairly quick in that first movement and really dramatic and everything just beautifully phrased. It's a pretty good sounding recording for a, a live performance. Um, he did also do a studio version, which is for him a good, a good studio, uh, a good example of his studio recordings. That's with the Vienna Philharmonic on EMI. Uh, if you're fussy about sound quality, you might prefer that one. But considering that you already have a, a great Brahms fourth here, if, if you can find it, I recommend this one. All right, now let's talk about the final Mozart symphony, the Jupiter. And oh, this one is, is fantastic. It's real powerful, dramatic, and it's that final movement that um, really is, is groundbreaking. Uh, it's a fugal movement that just ends in this this, this wonderful uh, feeling of exaltation. Um, I've already mentioned the Bernstein recording of the 40th. He brings the, uh, the, the 41st is, is, if anything, even better. He brings that rhythmic, uh, he, uh, how, to, how to say it, he, 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 he just has a way of, of this, this understanding of how to do rhythm that is just, you cannot teach. Um, it also, and, and as well as that understanding of structure and you've got the, the power and the beauty of the Vienna Philharmonic and the sound quality, so there is that one. Uh, there is also Thomas Beecham, but not the old one that I was just mentioning. This one is, I don't know if I can find it, is Sir Thomas Beecham. Uh, but this is not the 1930s recording, uh, although that is also very good, but this is from 1957 with the Royal Philharmonic. Uh, and this one is uh, excellent. Uh, it, it shows Beecham at his best, uh, his exuberant energy that he brings, especially to the finale, uh, and, the, the, and the power and the grace, it, it's all there. So that's a great Mozart 41st. As is, I'll bring it out again, Macaris again. Uh, this is maybe the highlight of this cycle. It's just really exciting. 
uh, and the the plane is incredible, um, and the clarity and the sound quality you, you can't go wrong with this. Um, you also cannot go wrong with Bame and the Vienna Philharmonic. This is one of the highlights of this set. Uh, it's just very powerful, beautiful playing. Uh, this is Bame when he's really on with his Mozart. And finally, mention got to mention Klemperer. This is his mono recording from 1954. This is a little heavier, but it's really powerful and and uh, surprisingly exciting in that final movement. Uh, it just really gets you know gives me you know goosebumps, <laughs> uh, it, despite the 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 somewhat limited uh, recording quality. Uh, definitely a version to savor if you love the Jupiter Symphony. All right, that is Mozart. We are getting to the end. I, I promise I'm going to make it through this. Uh, let's now turn to Prokofiev, 20th century Russian composer, uh, brilliant orchestrator, um, uh, gorgeous string writing, really colorful. Uh, of course, he, uh, he composed the ballet Romeo and Juliet, which is the first way I got to know Prokofiev, uh, which is just gorgeous orchestral writing, just a, a potpourri of of, uh, of uh, beautiful orchestral uh, moments. So it should be a no surprise that he also wrote symphonies that are similarly colorful. Uh, and the uh, version of his most famous symphonies that I recommend come from Carian with the Berlin Philharmonic. Uh, the first symphony, nicknamed the Classical Symphony, is more compact. Uh, this was recorded in 1981. And then his really considered his masterpiece is the Fifth Symphony. Uh, Carrion recorded this one in 1966. And uh, so the plane is fantastic. The sound quality is fantastic. Uh, with Prokofiev, uh, it helped to have really beautiful string sound. And Carrion and Berlin were immaculate in their string sound quality. So it's got all the color and excitement you would want from these symphonies. However, I have to mention a historical choice. Serge Kusevitsky, Boston Symphony from the late 1940s. Uh, they perform this music uh, like it's in their blood. Uh, just really exciting, really spontaneous sounding. Um, Boston, the Boston Symphony strings under Kusevitsky were also really famous for their fantastic quality, fantastic sound, uh, and their virtuosity. So. I would say, even though this is limited sound uh, from the 1940s, uh, you really are, are going to want to hear this. This is one of the classic Prokofiev recordings. It also comes with some excerpts uh, from Romeo and Juliet as well. So this is indispensable, as they say. All right, another 20th century Russian composer, Rachmaninoff. Uh, oh, Rachmaninoff. Uh, you know, was there ever anyone besides maybe Mozart and Tchaikovsky who, who was better at composing uh, melodies that you know that stay with you. Um, although I would say that I think that Rachmaninoff is strangely enough a little underrated as a composer, uh, maybe because he wrote so many beautiful tunes. Um, I actually sang uh, in the Rachmaninoff Vespers, his choral uh, masterpiece. The Rach actually, it's the All Night Vigil, but sometimes called the Vespers. Uh, I sang that last year with the Texas Choral Consort. Shameless plug, if you want to go look for it on YouTube. Um, and that's just a masterpiece. It's just just one of the most uh, amazing choral pieces ever written. Um, now, for symphonies, his most famous symphony is number two. Uh, and yes, it's it's got the great melodies. The the adagio, the third movement. Ba 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 ba. Schmaltzy is all get out, right? <laughs> but it's. <laughs> Beautiful. And the recording that I choose for this one is Gennady Rozdestvensky with the London Symphony, a digital recording from 1988. It's a live recording, but it sounds just fine. And Rozdestvensky knows just how, how to pace things. Uh, it's, it's beautifully played. Uh, there's a moment towards the end of the adagio where it's kind of climbing up softly. And then he just pauses a second before coming back down. And just that pause is an example of what a great conductor does, where he knows just how to maximize 
the uh, the emotions of a work. Uh, so this is one that I, I this to me is the only one you really need. So that's Rachmaninoff. Now we are to the S's, and the first one I'm going to discuss is the French composer Camille Saint-Saëns. Uh, Saint-Saëns, probably his most famous uh, work is the Carnival of Animals uh, with you know, the, that beautiful swan movement. Uh, so obviously he, he really knew his stuff when it came to orchestrating. Uh, it's, it's really colorful. Uh, but he was actually most known in his day as an organist. Uh, he was the greatest organist of his time. And so it should be of no surprise then that his most famous symphony, Symphony Number no. 3, features an organ. And so it's known as the Organ Symphony. Did I say organ? Organ, not the state. <laughs> um, and the recording of choice for this one, no surprise. Uh, Charles Munch, uh, Boston Symphony. Uh, so it's recorded in 1959. Again, a, a vintage recording, RCA Living Stereo. Sounds great. Uh, this is just uh, you know, wonderfully dramatic, powerful, and the recording quality just accentuates that. Uh, this is, you know, not controversial, and I don't mean to be conventional in my choices, but this is another example where if you're going to have one recording of the Saint Saint Organ, Sym Organ Symphony, this is the one to have. It's a sonic spectacular, and it's uh, supremely dramatic. Get it. <laughs> All right. Now we are to Franz Schubert almost a contemporary of Beethoven, a little later than Beethoven, uh, because he died young. Uh, he died only a few years after Beethoven. Uh, we almost think of him that way, but he was actually born, uh, like, I think, almost 30 years after Beethoven. But Schubert uh, was an early Romantic composer, uh, one of the great composers of all time. Uh, and his Eighth Symphony was the nicknamed the Unfinished Symphony because drum roll, he didn't finish it. <laughs> he only finished the first two movements, but they are fantastic movements, uh, short, as, they, short as, as, as it is, especially that first movement, one of the most famous things uh, Schubert ever wrote. I, I first learned about it from watching the Smurfs as a kid. Uh, it's that da 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 You know that. All right, so we've already talked about uh, Giuseppe Sinopoli, Sinopoli with regard to the Mendelssohn Italian Symphony. Uh, it is coupled with, if I can find it, here it is. It is coupled with the Schubert Eighth Symphony, and this is also a fantastic recording and my top choice for that symphony. Uh, it's, it's beautifully played, beautifully recorded. Uh, it's a little slower. Uh, maybe in, the, in that first movement that some people uh, might prefer, but uh, it's very dramatic. He, he, he builds that mystery of that, that beginning, and then the, you get the middle of the movement, and it's just oh, so, so dramatic, and uh, this recording uh, does it full justice. So that's the Eighth Symphony. The Eighth Symphony is often paired with the Ninth Symphony, uh, nicknamed the Great. Uh, so I'm going to address couplings of both the 8th and the ninth in just a moment. Uh, first, I'm going to discuss my top choice, however, for the ninth symphony, if you are keen to get that by itself. Now this one, I am actually going to recommend a mono recording. <gasps> yes, mono, 1951. This one is with Fortwanger and the Berlin Philharmonic. And this is actually uh, one of Furt Wenger's most recommendable recordings. It, it's sort of like a, a gateway recording for people getting into Furt Wenger, precisely because of the reason that it is so well recorded for its time. Uh, and it's in repertoire that you know he knew like the back of his hand. Uh, he, he does the Schubert Ninth, which is a, a more like, obviously compared to the Eighth, uh, since he, he actually finished it, a more grand symphony uh, dramatic, powerful, and uh, Furtwanger brings all that home in this in, in his interpretation, which makes the most of all the climaxes and paces everything in a way that it all just makes sense. I'll be honest, I didn't even like the Schubert Ninth Symphony until I heard this recording, so I highly recommend this one. Now, if you want to get both symphonies together, 
an excellent choice and one that is very celebrated is this one from Joseph Cripps. The Eighth Symphony is recorded with the Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, it was recorded in 1969. And then you have the Ninth Symphony, which was recorded in 1958 with the London Symphony. They both sound fine, though. They, in fact, more than fine. They both sound fantastic in, in uh, the Decca. I mean, this is vintage Decca sound. And Cripps was one of those conductors who was, you know, non-interventionist, just let it happen naturally. Uh, but he knew his stuff. And these are immaculately paced Schubert recordings. Uh, they're not maybe the most dramatic you can find, but they, they do the job. And you might even argue that for a composer like Schubert, as opposed to say maybe Beethoven, that it actually worked better to have someone who wasn't maybe overly emotional or overly dramatic, perhaps. These are great recordings, however you cut it. Now for something a little, now that's, Cripps is a little bit on the you know, sort of traditional heavy side. For something a little lighter and swifter, we have George Zell and the Cleveland Orchestra. These are from the late 50s, and these are fantastically uh, energetic, light on their feet, especially number nine. The, the finale is just really exciting. Uh, of course, crisp, clear, all those things you expect from Zell. This is a classic recording. A slightly newer recording, this one comes from 1995, comes from Gunter Wand uh, with the Berlin Philharmonic, recorded live in 1995. Now, Wand uh, is also, like Cripps, not the most exciting, overtly exciting uh, conductor around. I, like I was saying in his Bruckner recordings, uh, the, the genius of Wand is the way he just patiently paces things and let, lets the, the power of the music come you know, be felt over time. And I would say that is the case here. He doesn't, you know, hit you over the head with a drama. It's not necessarily the most exciting, viscerally exciting recordings, but it's, for one thing, it's just beautiful. It's just gorgeous. And it does the job. And by the time you get to the end of the ninth, um, the crowd is jumping to their feet and applauding like they should be. So this is a really, really good recording in, in digital sound. Finally, for the 8th and 9th, if you want them together, I am going to go back again to Fort Fangler. This is from a concert of the 8th and 9th, recorded in 1953 with the Berlin Philharmonic. And the 9th here is, I would say, even, even better than the one that he did for Deutsche Grammophon in the studio. Good as that one is. And they're both great. Uh, but this one, you also get the 8th. And uh, what Fort Fangler brought to the 8th was just this great drama i mean it you know it, it it's it's the it's his music <laughs> i don't know how else to put it he, he understood that it's kind of like when you're talking about Tolich and dvorak when you hear furtlinger doing schubert or bruckner or, or beethoven it's you're, you're hearing you're hearing something that's like you know idiomatic and it, it sounds like something he was just born doing and the sound quality in this recording is great for a live recording from the 50s. One of the best that Fort Flanger got with the Berlin Philharmonic. Um, this is another one that you can find in this box, like I was talking about some of the ones earlier. Let's see, did I skip any? Uh, we, we mentioned the Beethoven 5th and 6th from two concerts, 1947 and 1954, both fantastic. Also the Brahms 3rd that I mentioned earlier is in this one. Uh, and then we have uh, some great Wagner, which we're not covering in this video, but then we also get this Schubert 8th and 9th. So uh, this is really a set to get if you uh, are interested in Fort Wenger because he, his best stuff was his live recordings. And not only are these great interpretations, the recordings are really good too. All right, so that is Schubert. Now we move to a more modern composer, 20th century uh, Russian composer, Dmitry Shostakovich. Shostakovich uh, was a product of the Soviet era Russia, and uh, he was sort of like the, the Mahler of Russia, uh, <laughs> but even more so just very dramatic and, and in some ways you know, depressing a lot of the time, uh, and just one of a kind. Uh, I love Shostakovich. Uh, if, if you're looking for something that is, is great, but not the traditional sort of, uh, you know, Viennese German tradition, uh, 
Shostakovich is, you know, wonderful. Uh, his fifth symphony uh, is, along with the tenth, his most popular. And for this one, I recommend Nima Yervi with the Scottish National Orchestra. Uh, so it's recorded in 1988 uh, for Chandos. Uh, it sounds wonderful, and that's part of the appeal of this. The sound is wonderful, the sound that they produce. Uh, and it's it's just this, the sound is, it's, it's this beautiful darkness that they bring to it. Uh, it's not the most overly, you know, overtly dramatic reading of the piece, but I think it works. I think especially as a way to hear it for the first time, uh, you know, I, I hate to say the symphony speaks for itself, but in, in this case, it sort of does. Uh, you just need a conductor who knows what he's doing and an orchestra that plays beautifully, but also in a way that uh, communicates the spirit of the music, which in this case is, is fairly dark. They do that in this recording. So this is one to get. If you do want something that is more, uh, let's say, um, obviously dramatic in the way it's paced, there's this one, Evgeny Merevinsky with the Leningrad Philharmonic. Uh, this is a live recording from 1984. Merevinsky was uh, a, a, you know, a big Shostakovich champion, of course. He was also in Russia at the same time. And this one just milks the emotions for all they're worth. It's, it's, almost, it, it's almost over the top. <laughs> How dramatic this is! Uh, it's a live recording. It's fairly, it's fairly clear, but uh, there are some noises here and there. But uh, if you want to hear sort of maybe compared to Yerby, something that's more idiosyncratic, you might say, and uh, dramatic, there's this one. There is also a champion of Shostakovich from this side of the Iron Curtain, Leonard Bernstein with the New York Philharmonic. Uh, this is a recording from 1959, and this one just hits you right from the beginning. Uh, with uh, It's got great sound, for one thing. Uh, the New York Philharmonic is in top form. Uh, it's superbly dramatic, very assertive. And that final movement, he takes it at a very brisk pace, almost an impossible pay pace. But obviously, for that reason, very exciting. However... There is another recording of Bernstein, which, you know, again, this is one of those debates where this version or that version. This is from 1979, and this is recorded live in Tokyo with the New York Philharmonic. And this version, I would say the 1959 is the first one to get because you get the full, the full Bernstein. <laughs> it's, it's a unique recording. Um, this is more conventional, you might say, but it's also a more mature Bernstein. It's not as fast in the finale. The emotions are held in check more, but it it still brings home the emotion of the Shostakovich Fifth. Uh, and you might you might argue a more impactful way. Again, you can argue one way or the other. I would get them both, and that's why I have them both. Um, now let's talk about a couple of more. This one is from Andre Previn, and this is one where the emotions are held in check a little bit more and then he kind of picks his spots. It's a really, really powerful interpretation overall. Uh, this is with the London Symphony uh, from 1965, uh, beautifully recorded, uh, one of the standard choices. However, the historic choice comes from Leopold Stokowski with the Philadelphia Orchestra. We haven't talked about Stokowski yet. This is from 1939. This is one of those Dutton transfers I was talking about where the, it sounds really cleaned up and you almost can't believe that it was made that long ago. It's still going to be limited, but, but, uh, but it's fairly clear. And Stokowski, you know, we haven't talked about him yet, but Stokowski was, uh, he, he always brought home the emotion. Uh, he was definitely not one of those, you know, stick beating, uh, you know, uh, disciplinarians. Uh, Shostakovich um, believed in uh, lush orchestral sounds. Uh, he often did um, really, uh, he was sort of a maverick sometimes with his tempos, but this Shostakovich fifth is to me the most uh, emotional, uh, the most emotional, the most uh, grinding, 
the the one that just has the deepest for me emotional impact so if you can handle the sound quality i recommend this one all right now let's talk about the seventh uh, a little bit more of a mercurial one this one is nicknamed the leningrad um, and for this one i just have one recommendation and that is bernstein uh, with the chicago symphony this is a legendary recording uh, it's in wonderful sound. It was uh, recorded in 1988, so you have no uh, issues with the sound quality. And uh, it's just one of those Bernstein recordings, kind of like his Mahler 6, uh, that uh, just doesn't hold anything back emotionally. And this is just has a devastating impact. I'm not saying it's the only recording you should ever get of the uh, Leningrad Symphony, but um, it's certainly... Um, the one that you should at least investigate before all others. Uh, it's really fantastic. So that's the seventh. Let's now talk about his other really popular symphony, the tenth. Uh, my recording of choice for the tenth is no surprise, Carrie Anne. Uh, this is uh, a very famous recording with the Berlin Philharmonic. He did do it twice. There's one from 1966. This is the later one in digital, 1981. Um, there honestly is not a whole lot to choose from. Uh, I, I just think in, in this case, uh, you, you get uh, maybe a little more beauty of sound from the orchestra. And in this case with Carrie Anne, I, I think that's something that really helps things. That this is a really dark symphony, and to hear that, that beautiful, deep uh, Berlin sound uh, really, really uh, works for this symphony. Um, it's also a very dramatic performance uh, and really hits, hits all the notes, and that's why it's uh, you know, such a well-known version. You can, however, also get the Shipway, Frank Shipway. We talked about him earlier. This is with the Royal Philharmonic, 1995. This is not going to have as uh, strong uh, an overt dramatic impact as the Carrie Anne does. Um, it, it's a little bit more held in check. Uh, the second movement, Allegro, doesn't exactly, you know, hit you over the head. Uh, but um, this one's just beautiful in the, in the way that it's, it's a little bit more nuanced, a little bit held back, and a little bit more starkly stark and, 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 and beautiful in that way. Uh, it, just a gorgeous version. For more modern, I'm really have to dip down here to get, I mean, we're getting to the end. <laughs> um, for a more modern version, we have this one from Vasily Petrenko. Which is, this is with the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic, 2009. It is, uh, compared especially to Shipway, it's more assertive. Uh, that Allegro, a second movement Allegro, is amazing. It's so exciting and, and uh, really thrilling. Uh, but, but this one is, is definitely uh, more, uh, not as, you know, say, nuanced or held back as Shipway. This one is more assertive and strong and recommendable for that reason. We have two more versions to talk about for this one, and these are both your uh, uh, proverbial historical choices. Uh, the first one is Dimitri Metropolis with the New York Philharmonic, 1954. Uh, really exciting. Uh, you know, it's not the best recording, but it's, it's really gripping and exciting. As is this one, even more so, I would say, Evgeny Merevinsky with the Leningrad Philharmonic, 1954. This, this one really is my desert island choice. Um, it, it really uh, goes for broke. Uh, we're going to talk about his Tchaikovsky in a bit. Uh, Merevinsky was just a conductor with a flair for the dramatic. Uh, and this, this one just, you know, just mix it all. And, and, the recording quality is pretty good for 1954, actually. Um, this could almost be a first choice, actually. It's, it's not that bad. So those are the two historical choices. And that is the end of Shostakovich. I'm really having to crouch down here. I'm on the bottom row. <laughs> We're almost at the end. Uh, we only have uh, two composers left. Uh, the first one is Sibelius. Uh, Sibelius was a Finnish composer. Uh, of the early 20th century. And um, his, his style was really colorful, um, atmospheric. And his, probably his most popular symphony is his second. And 
this one had all you know the, the charm and color that he was known for. Uh, more one of his more you know sunny symphonies, I would say. And my first version of choice for this one. Let's see if I can find it. Ah. All right is Barbaroli. This is a real famous version. Uh, this is with the Royal Philharmonic, 1962, and uh, Barbaroli just really uh, brings the character and atmosphere to this recording. That's why this one is so famous and well-known. Very well recorded as well. However, we also have fellow Finnish conductor Tano Hanikainen with the London Symphonia. Now, Hanikainen actually conducted at Sibelius's funeral. So he knew his Sibelius. And there is a character to this as well. It's a little bit more straightforward compared to Barbaroli. He doesn't play with the tempos as much. But there is an obvious love and affection for the composer as well as uh, an innate knowledge of how this should go. And so this is very recommendable for that reason. Very well recorded as well. I cannot say the same about this one in terms of recording quality, but for a performance that just knocks your socks off, I have to discuss the Beecham recording from 1954. This is a live concert with the BBC Symphony. This is just super exciting, uh, almost volatile. Uh, you, I, I think there's a point where you can actually hear Beecham yelling at the orchestra, <laughs> exhorting them for more. Uh, this is one of my favorite Sibelius uh, recordings. It's just uh, one of those kind of one-offs uh, that's just really exciting and really colorful. Uh, so there's this one. However, we have to talk about the historical of all historical recordings when you talk about any Sibelius, and that is Robert Kayanis, Finnish conductor. Uh, he also knew his Sibelius, and th these date from the 1930s. So they're fairly restricted, and even they actually, this one is from 1930, and I don't even think the, uh, the orchestra is even identified in this. Uh, you can get this, this is a Finlandia issue. I think uh, you can also get them in Koch. They, they come in different issues. Uh, the sound is obviously very restricted, but what you do hear in, in this recording is something you really just can't get anywhere else. It, 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 the music just sounds spontaneous, fresh, like, like they, they've just discovered it for the first time. It's got this visceral excitement to it. Uh, despite the sound quality, it's, it's still worth investigating for that reason. Okay, so that is the second. Now let's talk about the fourth. The fourth is a little bit darker, a little bit more mercurial, a little harder to, harder to get into. And my recording of choice for that one is this one from Lauren Mazel with the Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, first of all, beautiful sound, uh, the, both from the, uh, the, the orchestra and the recording uh, quality. And uh, as an interpretation, uh, Mazel brings all the drama, uh, just this uh, real, you know, icy quality that he brings to it, uh, which is fantastic. I think it really works well for this symphony. Uh, another famous interpretation is this one from Carian. Uh, Carrion was a very good Sibelian. This is with the Berlin uh, Philharmonic. Uh, dates from 1965. Uh, you can get the uh, the fourth through the seventh symphonies in a in like a duo pack. Um, I I just have this one with just the fourth and the sixth. Uh, Carrion, as you would expect, brings beautiful sound, uh, which really helps in this symphony. Uh, it helps with that you know, that dark quality. So there is that. One more version I want to talk about before leaving the fourth is again Beecham. Uh, this one dates from 1937. Uh, it's a studio recording with the London Philharmonic. And uh, Beecham uh, was a, a, a big uh, celebrant of Sibelius. And he really understood this symphony well. It's one of the most masterful uh, versions of this symphony. Very dark, very bleak. Uh, definitely one to check out, even with the constricted sound. So now let's talk about uh, another one of Sibelius' more popular symphonies, maybe because it's not so you know, bleak <laughs> compared to the fourth, and that is the fifth. Uh, very tuneful, very exciting. And my version of choice for that one is Leonard Bernstein with the New York Philharmonic, 1961. Uh, he also uh, recorded all the Sibelius symphonies. 
Uh, I think this one is uh, one of the highlights. Uh, one of Bernstein's best recordings, I think. Uh, just, just the New York Philharmonic, uh, they're immaculate, uh, very exciting. Uh, and this is just one of those recordings where everything just falls into place uh, wonderfully. Uh, we also have, I discussed earlier, Hani Kainen, again, with the London Symphonia. This one also uh, has that innate sort of understanding of Sibelius, uh, the charm, the excitement, uh, it's all here, as well as Kayanis again. Uh, this is with the London Symphony 1932. Again, constricted sound, but very exciting and spontaneous sounding and idiomatic in a way that you're, you're not going to find in many places, which is why we still listen to it, even though it's been almost, what, you know, almost a century since it came out. So that is the Sibelius V. And now we are to Sibelius's final symphony, the no number seven. Wow, this is just a beautiful work. It is actually only one movement. It's, it's roughly about 20 minutes long. And uh, it's it's somewhat mercurial in a way too, but it's, it's, it just has this transcendence about it. It's, it, it just feels like you're on this journey towards like towards heaven. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, my recording of choice for this one is again, Mazel, the one, uh, this is a great, you know, now there is a, uh, a complete set of the Sibelius symphonies with Mazel and Vienna Philharmonic, which is very recommendable. Uh, I like this single, version which has in, in the fourth which we discussed uh, a wonderful tapiola one of his tone poems and then this seventh uh, this seventh is wonderfully played just beautifully paced and it brings home the the drama and the emotions in a way that uh, i think just is is perfect so i recommend that for the seventh um, however i also recommend this one may be hard to find Eugene Ormandy and the Philadelphia Orchestra. This is from 1975, uh, sounds very good. Uh, it is a little bit longer. Uh, he, he stretches it out a little bit more and it really works wonderfully. When you, when you get to the end, uh, you really, the, the emotions really come home strongly. Uh, and so Ormandy really, really paces this symphony well. However, for the seventh symphony, you really need to hear this recording as well. Serge Kusevitsky with the BBC Symphony from 1933. This is the real stuff. <laughs> this is um, just a, a really uh, a strong, dramatic, emotional, uh, it, it all comes home in, in this uh, um, interpretation. It's restricted sound, it's limited, um, but it's one you definitely need to hear if you love this symphony. So there's that. Now we are coming to Tchaikovsky. And I'll tell you what, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna grab all these and stick them here so I don't have to keep crouching down. <laughs> now we are to Tchaikovsky. Of course we have to talk about Tchaikovsky. He wrote six symphonies, but it's, it's the last three that he's really most known for, especially number six, the Pathetique. That's, I mean, that's, uh, a top 10 all-time symphony. It's, it's just superbly emotional and dramatic. Uh, it ends desolately. Uh, it's, it's got one of the most beautiful tunes ever composed, uh, that, that second tune in the, in the uh, first movement. Uh, so let's dive into these, these symphonies. They often come together as a set, and I ac actually do recommend a single set for all three of them as your first choice, and that is from Evgeny Merevinsky, Leningrad Philharmonic, one of the classic uh, recordings of all time because you have the combination of a great Russian conductor and orchestra with fantastic Deutsche Grammophon sound from 1960. Merevinsky and uh, Leningrad were, they were a null holds barred outfit. Uh, <laughs> they, they just put the, put the pedal to the metal and uh, you may not want that as your only option, so that's why we have some others we're going to discuss, but you definitely have to hear these. The fourth uh, it might be the strongest of all. It's just uh, very assertive and dramatic. 
the fifth is, is also wonderful. And then the sixth, I, I think, is also the reference version. Um, they just, they just, uh, they, they don't leave anything unturned. Uh, it, it all comes, you know, home very strongly in this. Uh, now, however, uh, you might say that they overdo it a little bit, and in that case, you might want to uh, also have this, the Carrie-Anne Berlin Philharmonic recordings from the, mid, from the mid-70s. As we discussed, Carrie-Anne uh, and his Berlin Philharmonic were known for their strong string section, and they do a wonderful job with Tchaikovsky's melodies. Uh, you know, they just sound lush and beautiful. So it's a little bit more, you know, soft grained perhaps compared to Maravinsky. Uh, and for that reason, you may want to have it as a, as a second choice or maybe even a first choice if you want beauty of sound more than anything. Uh, the fourth and the fifth are wonderful. The sixth especially, that was a carry in specialty. Uh, you know, he does that beautiful melody Da di da di da 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 di da da. Yeah, it's ah, so beautiful. Um, but then that movement ends. It, it's just one of the most perfect movements ever composed. It ends with that wonderful drama, and then the final movement is the one that's just sounds um, like uh, un inconsolable, uh, just really sad. <laughs> and Carrie Anne's version of that was always really good. Uh, you know, there, there's a depth of sound to the Berlin Philharmonic, and the sound quality here is fantastic. So that's definitely one of the, you know, th that's something you want to hear if you love Tchaikovsky. Now, those are sets of the final three symphonies. I'm going to discuss a few, you know, is, is singles, so to speak, uh, that are also really great. Uh, one is from Claudio Abado of the Fourth Symphony. Uh, now, he did record... Uh, these come from like a smattering of different, like there's the Vienna Philharmonic is, is the fourth. That's from 1975, I believe. The fifth then is from the London Symphony. And then you have the sixth, which is also then back to the Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, you can get those as a set like I have here. They also come as a twofer. Or you can get the fourth uh, just with the second symphony as a single disc. You know, take your pick. But definitely the fourth, and they're all really good. But the fourth is the one that is the, the real keeper. Uh, Abado starts it somewhat patiently, uh, but the Vienna Philharmonic plays beautifully, and then he really hits those climaxes. He really hits those spots, and he has a real exciting final movement. By the way, that that final movement is is nuts in the Maravinsky recording <laughs> of the of that fourth symphony. That's that's just really something. But Abado uh, he does really well with it too. So there is that. Um, also, a couple of more vintage recordings. These come from Ferenc Fritschoy. Uh, the fourth comes from 1952 the, with the Berlin Radio Symphony Orchestra, and then the fifth comes from 1949, as the date so clearly states here, there it is, uh, with the Berlin Philharmonic. And actually, these are both mono, but they sound really good, kind of like that Furtwängler Schubert we were talking about earlier. The, there are Deutsche Grammophone studio recordings that still hold their own. And Fritschoy just brings that visceral excitement that he brought to basically everything he conducted. Um, there's a grittiness here um, and just a suaveness with the way he, he, he conducts Tchaikovsky that's, that's really great. Um, another conductor we want to talk about is the old-fashioned romantic Willem Mangelberg. Now, these are from the 20s. These are actually from 1928 to 1929. And this is the fourth and the fifth together. And these are just wonderful. Um, it, again, he, like I said earlier, he was very flexible and romantic. You might say idiosyncratic, but it really fits with the Tchaikovsky. He really understood the music well. And to be honest, if I was to have one performance of these symphonies to hold on to, if I didn't care about sound quality, it would be these, actually. Um, the sound quality is not bad, but it's it's not great either. It's what do you expect? It's the 1920s. But as for performances, these are ones to savor, for sure. All right, so that is uh, the fourth and fifth symphony. I want to talk now about some singles of the sixth symphony. You have to. It's such a great work. Uh, you have to talk about more versions of this. And starting with Giulini, 
and the Philharmonia in 1961. Uh, we talked about earlier, Giolini was a very spiritual conductor. He tended to conduct things more expansively, and he does do that here. He starts it more gradually. He's, he's not like Merovinsky. He's not as assertive, but this one really is powerful. It, it really brings home the greatness of the symphony, and uh, you could argue that this is really a, a top choice for this symphony. Um, I, I would, and the recording quality is very good for its time, 1961. So there is that. Closer in time to us here in 2023, we have this one. Uh, this is Mikhail Pletnev and the Russian National Orchestra. Now he came out, uh, the same group came out in 1991 on Virgin uh, with the Pathétique Symphony and uh, that one was very celebrated. This one is very similar. Uh, there's not much to choose between them. I like this one a little better because I think it's a little bit more exciting, uh, better sound quality. Uh, this is a different type of interpretation, uh, especially from like say someone like Carrion. Uh, this is a little bit uh, more reserved. Uh, it's not as lush in the, in the string sound. It's a little bit more cold, which you might say kind of fits Tchaikovsky. Hey, you know, the cover kind of denotes that here, right? Um, <laughs> uh, but it's it really works well in its own way. Uh, it shows you that there's there's more than one way, uh, one way to do it, and it's a very dramatic uh, version that I think holds its own. As does this one. Oh boy, here we go, Teodor Clarensis. Uh, with the Musica Eterna, uh, which dates from 2015. Uh, he's like Honick. Uh, he's sort of a modern conducting sensation. But Carensis is, uh, uh, what do you say? He's sort of a maverick. <laughs> uh, this is ballsy Tchaikovsky here. Um, now, first of all, the reason to hear this, uh, I mean, it he just stretches this orchestra to its limit. Uh, they play the hell out of this piece. They milk the drama. Uh, they do things that you just would only imagine an orchestra doing. At the same time, it is somewhat eccentric. Uh, sometimes it sounds like they're doing, doing things for effect. So for me personally, um, I love this symphony and I know the, the, the spiritual element of it, or you know, you might the emotional element, you might say, uh, it, it can kind of detract from that a little bit, and yet at the same time, it's so damn impressive. Uh, and it's also emotionally impact in, in, impactful in its own way. So, I for those reasons, I do recommend this, and it's obviously you know, immaculately clean uh, recording technology from just you know, less than a decade ago. So, there's that. Now, let's talk about some vintage versions. And I'm going to start first with Frank Fritschoy. Two versions to talk about. He actually has a third one too. Uh, that's on Orfeo, but these are on Deutsche Grammophon. And the amazing thing is how different these two versions are from each other. It's almost like if you've, ever, if you've ever played golf and you've hit a shot that went way to the left, and then your next shot, you went way to the right <laughs> because you're overcorrecting. It almost feels like that here because first of all, this one. This is the Berlin Philharmonic, 1953, and it is incredibly exciting, very intense. Uh, it, it caused kind of a, a sensation when it was released. The one thing I would say about it, however, is it could breathe more. Uh, like, for example, that, that, in, uh, that theme, that, that uh, beautiful string theme in the first movement, it, it almost sounds kind of prosaic in this version. It, it's, it's kind of run through quickly. Um, it's a little hurried is what I'm trying to say, but it's still very dramatic and very impactful. And I would recommend it as one of the top choices. If I didn't like this version even better, and this is from 1959, his stereo version with the Berlin Radio Symphony Orchestra. And like I was saying, it's almost like this is a correction from that performance because here, if anything, that theme in the first movement is eccentrically slow <laughs> all of a sudden. <laughs> Um, I think I've read that this performance actually, I've never timed it, but I, I think it takes like a full eight minutes longer than that first version. But it is just one of the great pathetiques on record, and it's very well recorded, which, which adds to its appeal. Uh, if, if you enjoy this symphony, not only for the visceral drama, but also the, the, the emotional impact of it, uh, this one, especially in that final movement, 
uh, it's just really wonderful. He, he does stretch things out a little bit, a little bit and maybe because he was close to death there was that element uh of 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 uh just it being that much more uh important to him who knows uh but it's really a special recording oh look who's here oh, my cat claude decided to make an appearance i think he wants me to end this thing <laughs> all right we'll be done soon all right just be patient <laughs> all right so that is free choice and I only have a couple more to go. Uh, one more vintage recording. You know, it's a rule. If you listen to classical music, you have to own a cat. I don't know why that is, but it's, it's just something. <laughs> OK. Um, so this one is from William Steinberg, a conductor we've not talked about yet. This is with the Pittsburgh Symphony, uh, 1954. Steinberg was one of those under the radar people who wasn't as flashy and wasn't as well known, but he was really, really uh, solid. Uh, and uh, this uh, pathetique is a really, uh, yeah, it's a really solid interpretation. It, it, it checks all the boxes. It brings home the lyricism, the drama, uh, incredibly played. And I have to, I have to add this series of recordings, capital, full dimensional sound. It's another one of those vintage recordings that even though this is, this is mono, so it's not super great, um, it's somewhat limited. There's a detail and a vibrancy to these recordings that is just wonderful. So this is recommendable. recommendable. However, for the pathetique, uh, I still have to go back to, as an interpretation, Fort Fangler. Uh, his 1938 studio recording uh, was very famous in its day. Even Toscanini liked this performance, uh, allegedly. Uh, this was with the Berlin Philharmonic. It's a studio recording, so for its time, it's, it's, it sounds pretty good. It's pretty clean. It is going to be somewhat limited. This is, uh, again, one of those Dutton transfers, so it's very clean. Uh, and for Wenger just had a way of ennobling this music. <laughs> uh, not that others didn't, but, but he, he did it in a way that was, you know, he combined all the elements of the drama. It, he definitely was not like Maravinsky. He's, it's not as assert assertive, especially th this recording. Uh, compared to his later one, which I'll get to in just a sec. Uh, this one is very patient, very eloquent, and in that sort of understated way, it, it brings home the emotions. Uh, it's just gorgeous. The way, the way he, he paces everything and his understanding. You know, he, he was, again, an intuitive conductor. He just understood the emotions of the work and, and how to just communicated in that way that you you can't it's it's just hard to explain however i would say uh perhaps you might uh, there's a stronger case to be made even for his later one but it's a little bit noisier this is from 1951 it was recorded live in cairo with the berlin philharmonic uh the recording is noisier but it is more present it's also kind of scratchy uh, but but it, it is more present. It has more body to it than the earlier one. This one, the emotions it hang out more. Uh, I would say the first one maybe arguably is better balanced, but this one just really. I mean, listen to that third movement. Um, it's it's just crazy the way he <laughs> he he, uh, he uh, paces it. Uh, it's almost you know you almost can't believe it uh, when it when it uh, when it reaches its climax, uh, and it's just everything is really milked. Uh, uh, totally in, in this one as well. So th this is, I, I think, one of Furt Wenger's greatest uh, recordings, actually. And, and in fact, it is another one that you can find in this box. So what a perfect way to end. That is it. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. Those of you who made it to the end here, uh, please feel free to leave comments. I love comments. I love conversation. Uh, I don't believe anybody has all the answers or anybody should have all the answers. So uh, please feel free to leave comments on any portion of the, videos, the video that you like. Uh, with that said, I wish you all well. Happy listening.